Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Crime Weekly. I'm Stephanie Harlow. And I'm Derek Lavasser. So today we're finishing up with the Jennifer Kessie case. This is the third and final episode. And tonight we're basically going to go over theories, basically, because there's there's actually a pretty strong theory that that a lot of people believe is the theory to go with in this case. And we're going to talk about where the case is now, because actually, as of 2023, I think January of 2023, there's been some new developments and and there's been some movement on the case, which is great because uh, Drew and Joyce Cassie have not stopped. And I don't think they will stop. They will either die or find out what happened to Jennifer, but they'll never stop trying to figure out what happened to their daughters. So we should dive right in. Do you have anything that you want to say? Nope. Let's get to it. We we have had a lot of people DM us about their theories as well, and people are commenting on the videos. So yeah, I think this is what people want to talk about. All right. So in 2016, Jennifer Kessie was declared legally dead by the state of Florida. And her father, Drew Kessie, said, quote, that was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. I stood in a courtroom alone while a judge declared her deceased. End quote. But this kind of kickstarted everything. This was really when Jennifer's family began pushing their own investigation into high gear. They hired a private investigator and they also retained a lawyer in an effort to obtain Jennifer's case file from the Orlando Police Department. And in January of 2018, on the 10 year anniversary of Jennifer's disappearance, the police and Drew and Joyce Cassie spoke at a press conference during which a Lynx bus with Jennifer's face on it, as well as information about how to obtain the $15,000 crime line reward for information about what happened to Jennifer was on display. And something interesting I read in one of these articles about that press conference. So during this press conference, the papers reported that Joyce Cassie's car was broken into and her purse and her cell phone were stolen. And this article doesn't obviously give a lot of details about this event besides to say that the Orange County Sheriff's Office was investigating, but I figure if it was just like a standard robbery thing, and Joyce hadn't been targeted specifically, we would have heard about that. You know, like Joyce's car was just one of many that was broken into that day when everyone, including the police, were busy with this press conference. But as far as I can tell, It seems to have just been Joyce's car that was broken into, her cell phone taken, her purse taken. And I don't know why, but that detail kept nagging at me because it's like you're giving a press conference for your daughter who's been missing for 10 years. You're asking for more information. You're talking about the reward, $15,000 for information. And then your car gets broken into and your purse and your phone gets stolen. But it's not like just a random robbery. It seems to be targeted. Like, am I crazy for thinking there's more to this than there is? I mean, you're not crazy for thinking it. It could be a coincidence, but I I do think with the surrounding circumstances, it does make you wonder, is there more to it? Because with everything that's happened in this case, it does seem in certain situations like this was more premeditated uh, than some random act of violence. So you wonder how deep it goes, right? Like how many people may be involved with this and what lengths would they go to try to cover it up? Yeah. And like, what are, what are they doing with, you know, her purse, her cell phone, things like that? It's almost like somebody knows something, right? Maybe more than one person. They know what happened to Jennifer Kessie and they're still walking around out there. And we would assume, you know, at least at the time of this press conference, maybe even still living in Orlando, Florida. And now this press conference happens and Joyce's car out of all the cars of all the people who are at the press conference gets broken into. So I just thought that was kind of strange, like somebody's messing with her or they want something or something like that. I'm not sure. Could be completely random, but it could also be could be the person involved with this that was getting some type of gratification out of seeing what she mm-hmm. had been typing in her phone. There's a million explanations yeah. for it, but I don't think it's fair to say, oh, that yeah, just a random act of violence. Who knows? We don't know. Yeah, because it seems like her car was the only one. So that'd be a huge coincidence, I yeah. feel like, right? And usually you'll have a string of them where multiple cars that evening will exactly. be broken into. It's not just one car out of the whole street. Yeah, if there's like a car robber and they're like, oh, the police are doing a press conference. They're not they're not out patrolling the streets right now. Let me just go in and like break into all of these cars parked in this parking lot. Yeah, hand checking all the cars. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know about that. But I also found out that the Cassies ended up paying over $80,000 for case files. That's bananas. So like they actually paid the money 
to the Orlando Police Department to like have everything redacted and this, this and that. Like they paid over eighty thousand dollars for uh, case files. And that was something I found out actually from a recent article, which was dated in January of 2023, when the Cassies marked 17 years of not knowing what happened to their daughter. Yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy that they had to pay that much to just get the investigation. I know there's probably a cost associated with it. Like you said, someone human has to go through and redact all that. So they basically have to read every single page because if they don't redact something and it gets out there, it's yeah, their ass bad. on the line. So honestly, the cost is probably in line with how um, how much it would take to do that much to read all those pages. However, I don't think the family should be responsible for that. With all the frivolous spending that we have in our government, 80000 sounds like a lot of money to you and I, but to these budgets that they have for this, they should find a way to to cover that or at minimum offset the cost for the family. Because what if they what if this family did not have the type of money that the Kessies were able to raise? They just don't get any answers. The financial exactly. financial status should never be a barrier to entry for a family to get th- th- their loved one's case. That's crazy. Yeah, or to, to even try to like continue fighting for justice yeah, when ridiculous. you don't think the police department's doing enough. And I think Drew Kessie said when all is said and done, they spent something like six hundred thousand or seven hundred thousand dollars up until now on you know searching for her and hiring PI. PIs and hiring yep. lawyers and you know just putting out rewards and stuff like putting her face everywhere you know it's on buses and there's flyers and you know uh, Drew Cassie said we still even to this day we want to make sure that South Florida is just like a walking billboard for Jennifer we want her face everywhere which is you know, super smart, but the Kessies would launch their lawsuit against the Orlando Police Department in December of 2019. And the year prior to that, Orlando Rowland became the chief of police for the Orlando Police Department. And he hadn't been in charge at the time of Jennifer's disappearance, but he found himself sympathizing with Drew and Joyce Kessie. So Rowland actually gave his investigators six months to continue working Jennifer's case to see if they could come up with anything new. And then after that, he decided he would support Jennifer's family in their fight for these files, although apparently he didn't support a price decrease because... Yeah, clearly not. That might be out of his control, to be fair. I mean, that's a that's a city, that's a government thing, right? He He's an employee just like the rest of them. Could he have advocated for it more? Probably. But Dude, I will tell I you, these, these city halls, man, these town halls, they're cheap. I know, man. It was a joke. You don't have to defend him. (laughs) Damn, going after Rolon. And and I love that. I love love the fact that he gave him a say. He said, yeah, you know what? As we said last episode, it's been long enough. I'll Mm -hmm. give you six months. You guys are on notice. Solve it or it's going to him. Period. I love it. Like he didn't just pull it out from under them. He said, hey, whatever you got left, whatever you're considering working, you got six months. Which is a long time. That's a long time. And to, to give them that courtesy internally to say, hey, whatever theory you're thinking, whatever avenue you want to explore, do it. Because otherwise, it's going out. I love that. Yeah. And Orlando Roland said, quote, I can understand why they are frustrated. I can understand why they would feel that maybe an agency like ours has not delivered in a way that they would expect for an agency to do. After the number of years that we've spent trying to solve Jennifer's disappearance, I think it was time to also honor the wishes of the family. The family wants closure. We want to find the person responsible for her disappearance. I think it's a win-win for all, end quote. The Kessies would eventually reach an agreement outside of court with the Orlando Police Department, and this would include Jennifer's parents and their PI taking possession of over 16,000 pages of documents and 67 hours of video and audio, but... Part of this agreement stated that the Orlando Police Department would no longer be leading the investigation. From that point on, the only people who would be actively investigating were Jennifer's parents and their private investigator, Michael Toretta, who claimed that when he received and reviewed the files, which is something he did more than once, I think he said he ended up going through those files like three separate times, he said he was amazed at what law enforcement hadn't done and the people that they hadn't talked to. Michael Toretta said, quote, there's never been a quarterback in this case. There's a lot of information that could have been developed that I believe wasn't in the most critical hours of the investigation, end quote. This is interesting to me. It doesn't look like the Orlando Police Department are just like taken off the case, but it's like they're not going to be actively investigating it, which it doesn't seem like they were at that point anyways, right? In like 2018, 2019, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about it at the end, but when the uh, Kessies got these files, they said nothing had been added 
Nothing had been written into the files or added in like over a decade. So it doesn't look like the Orlando Police Department was like super high priority with this case to begin with, which is odd to me because I feel like this is a case that, you know, a woman's missing. So she could still be alive out there. This might be a case that you would want to follow all leads. And objectively, I think you'll agree with me once we go through this episode. That is not what happened here. Like they did not follow all the leads at all. Yeah. I, I, I'm not quite sure why the police department in this case chose to sort of half ass this. And, you know, once again, Orlando Rolon comes on, you know, later in the game. He clearly has a grip on things. He clearly wants to see things done right. But by this time, it's kind of already been a mess and too much time has passed. And there's nothing you can really do to rectify that situation at this point. Yeah. So a couple of things. I apologize if earlier, and I might've said it right. I can't remember, but I think I said 80,000 pages and you said it was $80,000 for 16,000 mm -hmm. pages. So mm -hmm. if I got that wrong, I apologize. Yeah. I'm with you. I want to hear the facts about the case. It definitely seems like there could have been more done. It's an interesting uh, play there where they're saying, okay, we're going to release it to you. We're, we're not going to fight you there but we're no longer the lead investigators on it. And right. to be completely transparent, that's not a big loss because as you just said, at this point, it's a box sitting in a storage room mm -hmm. and maybe every couple years, a cold case unit might get together or a meeting where they go through it, take a quick look at it. But other than that, it's just collecting dust. And it, it, it could be considered negligence and I'm not saying it's not, but it also could be, there's so many other, they, they might've, if they had done their job, let's just say they had investigated all leads. Well, you can't get blood from a stone. If they have no nothing else to follow up on, ha they have new cases coming in every day, just like this one that are, are, that are important to the people that were affected by it. So it gets, put into the evidence room and gets buried by the newer cases. Not saying it's right, just telling you the reality of the situation. But I think at this point, as you just said perfectly, they, they haven't really done it up to this point. So they're kind of trying to build a house on a shitty foundation. So that's why the chief is saying, hey guys, if there's anything you wanted to do, you got six months and let's be honest, you're probably not gonna do much in six months because we know what we got here and it wasn't done correctly. So I don't think it's much of a loss to not have them as the lead investigators. And I don't think there's any evidence that the private investigator would collect at that point where there might be a chain of custody issue because it's not mm -hmm. going to be a tangible piece of evidence like right. blood or anything of that nature. It might be a witness statement where he, he may right. go interview people. He's doing recordings. And if that happens, hypothetically, he goes and interviews witness X and they give a, a really great statement. He's going to relay that to the Orlando Police Department and they would have to re-interview them. So, yes, they're not the lead investigators, but it does seem like, hey, if you come to us with something, mm -hmm. we're going to we're going to go from there. But it's the balls in your court. And I actually love this. I wish more I do departments too. would do that, do, do it like this. I think that'd be great. Yeah, because it seems like obviously, um, you know, the Kessies and their private investigator, they can't make arrests, right? They can't, can't do arrests. stuff like that. So if you find something that that is substantial the police will step in if there's something that needs to be searched the police will step in like if you have enough evidence to show that something may have happened here and we have to search this field or this lake or this forest the police will come in they'll make arrests if they need to but That's they're right. sort of taking a back seat which i mean they have for the past decade on exactly. this so no biggie no no harm no foul no loss right nobody's going to investigate it harder than their own family anyways yeah, and, exactly. And you have some initial stuff in there. I, I love the idea of having a, a PI on it as well, someone who may have an mm -hmm. investigative background. So you are trying to do things close to how law enforcement would do it. Uh, yeah, like a liaison just, sort yeah, of, some, you know. You want to do it the right way because you, it, whatever you collect, you want to be able to use it. So mm -hmm. you want to try to do it the right way and so that you can present it to the law enforcement in a way where they're going to be receptive to what you have. Yeah. And the PI, Michael Toretta, he said he wanted to put this case together one puzzle piece at a time. And so the first place he started was Mosaic and Millennial, the apartment complex that Jennifer had only been living in for two months when she disappeared. And this is the place that both the Cassie family and the Orlando Police Department believe to be the scene of the crime, the location from which she was abducted. Michael Toretta believed and still believes that it was important to speak to some of the people who were living at the complex to get an idea of how others perceived life at Mosaic, whether they felt it was safe and secure, or if there were things that had left residents feeling unsettled. And we actually have a lot of firsthand accounts from people, specifically young women who did live there around the same time as Jennifer or a little bit after. And many of these women spoke about 
somebody who did leave them feeling a little unsettled, someone who um, was friendly, but kind of also creeped them out a little bit at the same time. And that person was a maintenance worker who went by the name of Chino. And this is not his real name. This is like, I guess, a nickname that he went by. And this Chino person, along with another maintenance worker named Ben, once again, not his real name, just a nickname, they were often seen together. And they seem to be the main focus when it comes to suspects or persons of interest. And there's just much more known about Chino, or at least these women who lived there have more to say about Chino. Most of the people who've made statements about Chino have asked not to be identified, so we won't be using their real names here. And we're going to start with Morgan, who was 19 when she moved into Mosaic and Millennial. She initially lived with two other roommates while she was attending uh, college classes during the day and bartending at a local restaurant at night. And this was uh, her first real apartment, like her first place where she was living on her own. So she'd wanted to live close to downtown Orlando so she could go out and have fun with her friends, but she also wanted to be someplace safe as a young single woman living on her own. Now, Morgan lived at Mosaic between 2003 and 2007. And when she moved in, she said it was an up-and-coming area and the complex seemed to be doing well because almost all of the units were full and it felt more safe, you know, just in general. There was more people living there. It seemed like their um, promises of security were being held to better. But not long after, Mosaic began doing the work of converting apartments into condominiums. And because of that, there was construction happening all year round, basically around the clock constantly. And people began to move out as well. So by the time Jennifer Kessie moved in, in late 2006, the complex was struggling to get tenants and there were tons of vacant units. Now, Morgan didn't know Jennifer Kessie, even though she lived in the building right next to Jennifer's. Jennifer hadn't been there long enough to meet the neighbors. You know, she moved in in November. She was missing by January. However, Morgan said that when she saw the figure on that surveillance tape, you know, the person who was parking Jen's car and furtively walking away, Morgan said she recognized him. Morgan said the person on the footage looked like Chino. She said, quote, the posture, the height, the hair, it was him. I'd been there for three years at this point, and if it wasn't him, it was someone very, very similar in shape, size, and stance. To this day, it makes me sick to my stomach, end quote. So Morgan said that Chino was very thin, a very small framed person with a bit of a hunched over posture. She said even the way his clothes fit, oversized and baggy. This resembled the person of interest in Jennifer's case. Morgan said that Chino's hair was longish and black, almost in like a bowl cut. She said it wasn't faded or shaped up. It was just kind of long and flowy. But why would Morgan think that this man, Chino, could have been involved in whatever happened to Jennifer? It couldn't just be because he resembled the person of interest. There had to have been something else that made Morgan feel a little weird about Chino. And we are going to discuss that when we come back from break. Everything's getting more expensive. And if you're already struggling under the weight of debt, it can feel like you're falling even further behind every single day. Don't you ever wish there was a better solution to paying off your debt? Well, PDS Debt has customized 0% interest options for anyone struggling with credit cards, personal loans, collections, or medical bills. With rising interest rates and the cost of living at an all-time high, now is the time to finally take initiative with your debt. Stop waiting and start saving with your own custom debt savings options from PDS Debt. Right now, PDS Debt is giving our qualified listeners a free debt savings analysis just for completing a simple 30-second online debt assessment at pdsdebt.com slash crime. You'll receive a full breakdown on how to save on interest each month and the quickest way to take care of your debt. If you're making payments every month on your debt and your balances aren't going down, this program is for you. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into one low 0% interest monthly payment. Everyone with over $10,000 or more in debt qualifies, and there's no minimum credit score required. Both bad and fair credit are accepted. You can save thousands in interest and fees and pay off your debt in a fraction of the time. Now, this is a really awesome opportunity for those of us who do have some debt. So if you're interested and you think that this sounds like it might be for you, Derek's going to tell you how you can get started paying off your debt right now. 
That's right. PDS Debt is offering free debt analysis to our listeners just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment at www.pdsdebt.com slash crime. That's pdsdebt.com slash crime. Take back your financial freedom today by visiting pdsdebt.com slash crime. Okay, we're back. So Morgan knew Chino because he worked as a maintenance guy at Mosaic and Millennial. And she claimed that although Chino was very friendly, he also kind of creeped her out. On the House of Broken Dreams podcast, Morgan stated, quote, there was a gentleman named Chino who worked there. And when I would be out late at night walking my dog after my bartending job, three or four o'clock in the morning, he would just be out walking around the parking lot. He would always walk up to me. Hey, how are you? What's going on? I always had this uneasy feeling, but then I also just thought, you're being paranoid. It's late and it is dark, but you know this guy works here. You know him, all of these things. I said, what do you do around here? He goes, I'm actually dating someone who lives in the building over there. He would point down yonder, but I never saw that person. I never saw him go in or out of the units, so I wasn't sure where he lived. There would be times when he would come over to try to knock on my door and just pop in, be friendly, ask questions, ask if I had any books to recommend. I'd share DVDs, and he was really, really friendly. Keep in mind, if any maintenance needed to be done, he was the one that was in there. So naturally, you start to have a relationship, you know, a cordial one. He would just come by often, unexpectedly, and nothing ever happened, and I never was put in a really uncomfortable situation, end quote. So Morgan thought that it was a little strange that Chino would be knocking on her door late at night or early in the morning, and he always had an excuse or a reason. He would say, you know, I was just out walking around, and I thought I'd stop in and see what you were up to. I saw your light on, et cetera, et cetera. Or, you know, me and my girlfriend got into a fight. I needed to get out of the house. And he was always very friendly and attentive. You know, he would ask Morgan about her night at work, how was school going, but Morgan felt that the whole thing was off. She said, quote, he was friendly, but it was in this fake textbook kind of way, kind of staged, didn't know his real name, didn't know his last name. He was this mystery guy who was just friendly, end quote. Morgan said that she went to college during the day and she worked at night, so she had a very set schedule. And it would have been easy for Chino, who was always at the complex, or someone else like him to have picked up on the pattern of that schedule. She said she would even joke around with him and ask, you know, what's going on? Like, how often do you and your girlfriend fight? Like, how are you always out here walking around? You know, why are you and your girlfriend always getting into fights at like three or four in the morning? Yeah, I think there's a few things that I'm I'm reading into this. So first off, this guy Chino. Mm-hmm. You no, know, it might seem difficult on the surface, but there's some investigative work that can be done there to try to identify this person at minimum. I'm not saying that they're the guy, but to at least look into them. There's only so I know there's other people in the building, but law enforcement can go over to this building that he supposedly lives in. You can start knocking on doors and you speak to every single tenant in that building until you find someone potentially who has a boyfriend named Chino. Now, if you don't, now it raises the stakes a little bit because now you have a person who's already lying to other tenants and you have to ask yourself why. Chino needs to be found. I don't know if they have. I don't know if we're going to get into that, but he needs to be identified. He needs to be spoken to. I don't know where this is going. You might tell me in the next section that they already did. But one other thought that I had, maybe this has been done, maybe it hasn't, but it's no secret that many people think that there's a strong possibility that the suspect was someone who worked at the facility, a contractor, a journeyman, someone like that who was on the property. Okay, if that's the case, I'm finding out from building administration every single person that was working that day. And I and it might have to go to subcontractors, things of that nature. I know that some people, I see you nodding your head. To the best that I can, I'm trying to identify every single person who may have been working that day. Then what I'm doing, it would have to be voluntary at this point. What I'm doing Again, it's outside the box, but I'm going to create a video lineup. And what I'm talking about here is I'm going to ask them, request that they dress in their work attire, and I'm going to have every single one of them walk by that camera the exact same way they would around the exact same time of day. And I'm just going to try to compare their their figure to the person that we've identified on camera. We don't know who it is, but is there anybody based on the angle of that camera that has a similar walk, a similar posture, a similar maybe bun, something like that as they walk by the camera where I see the two videos side by side and it looks like it could be them. For a lot of people in that lineup, it's not gonna look like them. They might be too tall, too short, too heavy, too thin, 
but you may have a couple that are that are similar in size and stature might narrow down your pool of people that it could be and you can start to investigate those individuals more thoroughly you are nodding your head so you you might i might be getting ahead here what's what do you want to say listen here's my question do you think it's appropriate for a man who works at the complex to be knocking on tenants drawers like doors not drawers <laughs> he's not <laughs> like doors either uh, young women who are single <laughs> yeah in the middle of the night at like three four in the morning do you think absolutely that's appropriate not. or professional yeah, no absolutely i know it's rhetorical but absolutely yeah absolutely not that's suspicious to me in yeah. general yeah 100 percent. because like what are you doing you know what is your goal yeah you, you got to find that person especially on the surface it mean you might be like oh maybe they're just a weirdo but that's all you have so you have to look into it. You have to go down that, you gotta go down that road until you get to a dead end. That's it, you have to go all the way. Now, whether they did or not, that's a different question. If they weren't able to identify this person, well, that's no, something did. you really gotta look into. You said they did? They they, they they talked to him. Okay, good, so we're gonna get there. But just on the surface, I and I, I'm, I have a feeling this wasn't done because it would be kind of a little bit of a logistical nightmare. I would try to get every single contractor that was working at that property the day before, the day after, the day of, and say, hey guys, you got nothing to hide. Listen, we just wanna rule you out. So everyone just, we're gonna transport you down the road. We're gonna have you walk, it's gonna take five minutes. We're gonna have you one by one walk by this camera and we'll have someone radioing up to us so we have a way of tracking who's who, right? Hey, this is uh, Derek Lavasser walking by now in three, two, have them walk by. You're gonna get the same frame rate, the same camera, the same angle, the same fence, the same palm tree, and hopefully they're wearing a similar outfit because a lot of journeymen will wear the same outfit, especially if they're like a painter or something like that. So have them walk by. Worst case scenario, no one matches a description. Best case scenario, you get four or five that look just like the guy on camera, and now you got some more potential leads to explore. Yeah, what it seemed like to me was the apartment complex, Mosaic and Millennial, didn't have like the best records about who was working there. <laughs> that's kind of what, kind of the, uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about it, but that's kind of the impression that I got. Like, I believe kind of it. people just showed up. Like, it was kind of one of those things where it's like, oh, if you can work, you know, there was like a set amount of people who were employed by them, but then they had, subcontractors and contractors and, and people who just show up if there needed to be specific work done or if they were free that day. So it was kind of like you never really knew who was there and who was working and what was doing what. And we're going to talk about that. And that's common, that. right? Like the apartment complex will hire a company, right? It's not super that, common, actually. Not at all. <laughs> it's I'm telling you, per, firsthand, it's common. I've investigated these types Terrible. of cases where you have you the company, when I hire a contractor, right? Even if I'm I'm doing a studio right now, I hire a carpet company. I might speak to one person, but I'm not asking them for the names and date of births of all their employees that are going to show up that day. So when I'm hiring Joe's carpets, Joe might have seven guys that work for him. Now I don't know if they're if they're on the books, if they're off the books. So when you think about all the tasks that are going on at an apartment complex, whether it's carpentry, painting, uh, plaster landscaping, whatever it might be, you're hiring five or six companies. Now those five or six companies may have four or five managers, may have two different teams. Now those teams may have guys underneath them who are the lower paying guys where they're having trouble getting people. So they're just bringing in anyone. So you, you have this tier effect where you may have a point of contact for the main person who runs those comp companies. But as far as who they're employing, you could end up hiring five companies, but have 40 different people on a job site any given day. That's that's very common in contracting. So let me clarify. It kind of seemed like even the complex didn't really know who all the people were. Like maybe the guys would bring like their friends or they would call a couple of their buddies and like, oh yeah, if you work for the day, you'll get like 40 bucks kind of thing. I believe thing. that. And so it was like nobody had like a complete staff list, which I think is incredibly irresponsible when you're dealing with, you know, a place where people live, you know, their homes, they should feel safe and there shouldn't be a bunch of strangers walking around that nobody has any paper trail about, right? Because it's a gated community, right? You can't just allegedly, you can't just drive off the street and go up onto Mosaic and Millennial and start like walking around and talking to tenants. Yet they have people who are like working there, I'm using air quotes, who are just showing up and wandering about and nobody knows who they are. And you're not supposed to, you know, that's just like, it feels irresponsible when you're, when you're boasting about how secure 
your community is. I mean, if it's a gated community, then you would think that every single person would at least have to check in. Yeah. I don't think the apartment complex would be responsible for vetting every employee under the con contractor they're hiring. But if they wanted to create a situation where they were at least aware of everyone, you have a check-in or a sign-in every morning where if you're coming to work on that at that premise, at that, at that facility, you got to check in. But I, I will say, I know that it doesn't happen. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but these apartment complexes, sometimes they're, they're agencies. They're not even like actual people who are on the premises. They have a management team. If they need, hey, we, we need these apartments done, they'll hire this team, this co company for to do 20 apartments. And they're not vetting every single employee underneath them, which that company, the subcontractor should be able to tell you who was working for them, whether it was a one day person or someone who's there all the time. There should be a trail that an investigator can go, okay, who'd you hire? Okay, now I go to the person I hired and then they can tell me. But there wasn't. And that's a problem. If the <laughs> subcontractor can't tell them who was working for them that day, that's a problem. I completely agree with you yeah. there. Yeah. So when I say like subcontractors, I don't mean like legitimate business people. I just mean like people that showed up to work. <laughs> what do you, I mean, yeah, I'm not following you. And I don't think our listeners. So what do you mean by that? So apartment, you don't think our listeners are following us, even though they haven't heard this yet, because we're recording it right now. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think they because I'm not following so you. Like, so maybe they're smarter than I am. And so like I could be technically me, Stephanie, by myself could be like a subcontractor. Right. But I'm not like working for anybody i'm just like oh hey i'm a contractor and i'll show up and i'll do this work but if i show up and do the work and i don't tell you who i am or where i live what my name is where i'm from i just take the cash 20 bucks 40 bucks that you give me and walk away there's no proof i was ever there right so they use the term like contractor subcontractor and that can but that can mean anything it doesn't have to mean like a person who has a business license or a professional person or a person who's under an umbrella any single person could be a contractor or a subcontractor or whatever. Like if you hired me to teach you about YouTube, I could say on my taxes, like, oh, Derek paid me a hundred dollars to teach him about YouTube. And I, I was a contractor. I like, I, I don't work for him. I, he contracted my work out. So I, I, the only reason I'm asking a lot of questions about this, cause I think it's important cause it's one of the more prominent theories. So what you're saying, cause and I'm writing this down too. What you're saying to me is let's say the man, the person in charge of construction at the apartment complex complex was Derek Lavasser. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is, what I'm thinking is Derek Lavasser hired four or five legitimate contractors with insurance, LLCs, whatever, and then they hired people or brought people in that they weren't aware of. That's what I was thinking. But what you're telling me, or I want to make sure I understand this, what you're telling me is Derek Lavasser, the person running the apartment complex, was actually employing subcontractors that they didn't even know they were just doing like cash on the day st jobs they weren't yeah. even going through a legitimate business no yeah okay okay i'm following yeah. you now so yeah the, that's where the buck would stop right so the, derek lavasser who is supposed to have a log of everybody he hired mm -hmm. is telling law enforcement yeah i would find this guy if he was willing to paint the hallways i'd let him in for the day to paint and there's no paper trail yeah, there's okay. no, and I mean, listen to this, okay? So Morgan, she said there wasn't even any, any like rhyme or reason to putting in a maintenance ticket if you needed something fixed in your unit. You know, like I don't know if you've ever lived in an apartment complex before, but let's say your faucet's leaking and so you you call the front desk and you're like, my faucet's leaking and they fill out a work order, okay? Yeah. And then they give it to whoever's available and then there's some like sort of, you know, paper trail about when the work order was put in, what apartment needed it, who was assigned to it, what time they're going there. She said there was nothing like that. It was just basically like my faucet's leaking and you'd find one of the maintenance workers that's just like wandering about and you'd be like, my faucet's leaking and they'd be like, okay. And so then your message would get to the, the appropriate person, I guess, through word of mouth. And I guess that would be Chino at that point who, who'd be doing the work. And when that happened, there was then no heads up or notification that someone would be entering your apartment. They would just show up and let themselves in without even knocking. Um, and Morgan said there was a few times she'd be in her unit and the door would just open and a maintenance guy would like peek in and he'd be like, oh, sorry, 
wrong apartment, which I find sketchy AF, okay? Like that's a concern. And I have lived in apartments and because of shit like this, I will never again because that has happened to me. And then I'll call the front desk and be like, this is ludicrous. I should not be sitting. I could have been naked. I think I remember saying that one time because I was in my living room and the dude just walked in and I was like, I could have been completely naked. You guys have to let me know. If somebody's coming to my place, like, well, this is crazy that you, that you don't. And they're like, oh, you know, he wasn't supposed, they always have an excuse. But she said that happened a few times. Worst of all, there was no documentation of when a work order was put in, when it was fulfilled, who showed up to do the work, or when they showed up to do the work. Therefore, there's no paper trail of who's in your apartment at any given time. Ever. Yeah, that's the, all of what you said, that's a problem. And I, this is a little bit of a, an assumption on my part, but it sounds like there might have been a master key or something of that nature where one key fit multiple units. And I mean, that should never be the case. Obviously, a- every individual apartment should be specific. You know, the key should be specific to the apartment and there should only be one or two p- different individuals who have access to those keys at any given time. There has to be uh, a, a system in sheet. place, a sign out <laughs> sheet where carpet guy needs to get into the unit. Derek, you got to go let him in then they can they can leave at their own time because you should only have one or two people facilitating that. It shouldn't be like, hey, here's a master key. Go to whatever apartment you need to go do your good. Obviously, you could have someone take advantage of that. They could make a copy of that key very quickly. Two dollars at the local locksmith yeah. store and or a little department hardware store. They're going to get a key made. No problem. You don't need to show any paperwork uh, or, or worse. You have someone who is just going in units and checking and saying, oh, sorry, just to see who's in there and to see what valuable items they may have. They could be casing the joint disguised as a worker. That's that's even scarier. So I don't like the idea that it seems like random people had access to apartments that were, were occupied. Yeah, it kind of seemed like maybe they just kind of gave out a list at the beginning of the day, like this needs to be done at this apartment and like go ham, yeah, you know? Just a, just and, a punch list. Yeah, which is not organized. And when that's your home, when that's where you're living and you will, you have some expectation of privacy, you have some expectation of like peace and quiet, you should be able to anticipate when somebody's going to show up to fix an issue, especially if that issue is going to take a long time to fix. You know, what if you just wanted to sit in, in your living room and watch TV and now there's somebody in your kitchen? So it's just super awkward. I own rental property and I and I have tenants. And when any, whenever we want to go into the apartment, whether it's to fix something that they requested, hey, Derek, my shower is leaking. Okay, no problem. I'm going to send someone over there on Thursday. I still have to give them a, I can't just say it over the phone. You have to give them something in writing just so Mm -hmm. they can't say, oh, they entered my apartment without them. You can give them, it has to be 48 hours, I think. Hey, listen, the plumber will be there on Friday between 12 and four. Please make sure that you're home or that you make me aware of it so that I can be there. And no one is ever allowed inside that apartment without a manager or the landlord to be present because now anything that goes missing, the landlord's responsible for it. So of course, there, yeah. there's, a, there's a system in place specifically in Rhode Island where uh, we have what's called section eight. So it's a, a government assistance program where you, ha- there's a very strict requirements to entering a tenant's apartment uh, with, you have to have consent. It's very, very strict. Yeah. As it should be, right? Yeah. Cause it's your yeah. home. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. All right, we're going to take a quick break and I'm going to come back and tell you more stuff. I do a lot of traveling and I find traveling and the airport to be incredibly stressful. So I welcome anything that reduces that stress. And that's where BASE comes in. BASE is amazing luggage, but it was created by actress Shay Mitchell, and she wanted to make sleek and affordable bags, luggage, and accessories that are designed to help you travel effortlessly while still looking fashionable. And BASE has really thought about everything that you could want in a piece of luggage. They have 360-degree gliding wheels that move very very easily. They have a cushioned handle, washable bags for your dirty clothes. They've got a bunch of interior pockets to help keep you organized. And best of all, they have a built-in weight indicator. So you can always tell like if you're over the weight or if you're, you know, right on the money so that you don't have to be opening your bag at the check-in desk and moving things around and being embarrassed. Now their luggage comes in all different sizes and colors and every piece is made to look better with miles. So you don't have to worry about your luggage in the overhead bin or the car 
cargo hold. And for shorter trips, Base makes the Weekender bag, which is super cute, super functional, and even has a separate storage area for your shoes. I love the Weekender bag. Um, it's one of my favorite pieces. I also love the carry-on roller bag, which they just brought back in Atlas Pink. It's an amazing color. And uh, the cosmetic case that they have is absolutely amazing. It's easy to wipe out and it's so easy to travel with. So if I have those three pieces, I'm ready for any trip, long or short, work or play, anything. Whether you're packing for a quick trip or just looking to breeze through security, Base has you covered. Just check out any of their 30,000 five-star reviews if you don't believe me. And Derek has a great deal for you if you want to check out Base for yourself, and he's going to tell you about it right now. Right now, Base is offering our listeners 15% off your first purchase by visiting basetravel.com slash crimeweekly. That's basetravel.com slash crimeweekly for 15% off your first purchase. One more time, that's B-E-I-S travel.com slash crimeweekly. All right, we're back. So when Jennifer Kessie went missing, Morgan thought about this and she thought about it, you know, about Chino being kind of weird and about like the maintenance workers just popping in all the time. She knew that Chino and some of the other guys had keys to all the units and she knew that often the maintenance guys would just let themselves in. So she was kind of like, did that potentially happen because they'd been told, the residents had been told that there was no sign of forced entry at Jennifer's apartment. And she's like, well, if there's no sign of forced entry and she was taken from her apartment, like, could it be that one of these guys just let himself in and took her? So she was kind of wondering that. And Morgan also talked about one of her roommates who ended up being so scared living at Mosaic and Millennial that she left, she moved out. This friend of Morgan's, let's call her Sarah, she claimed to see a person around the complex late at night taking pictures of her with like a legit camera, you know, one with a big zoom lens and everything. So Sarah lived on the second floor and sometimes this person would be like outside taking pictures into her window. Sometimes she saw them like... Um, in the hallway or something like that. And Sarah reported this to management, but they did nothing. Morgan said, quote, she would see this person like sometimes in a hallway. She even said that she saw someone in a unit with blinds that was supposedly an empty unit. Yet someone was in there taking pictures across into her building. She felt uncomfortable that management didn't address it. She felt she had done everything she was supposed to do. She was seriously worried for her safety. She ended up moving out. She would only walk the dog with her boyfriend there, and he would bring a gun to walk the dog. That was her level of fear or discomfort, end quote. And speaking of dogs, Morgan also said that she thought it was weird how she would often see dead dogs wrapped up in blankets placed near the dumpsters around the Mosaic and Millennial Complex. Morgan said, quote, It could be completely unrelated, but you want to think, if this is someone's family dog, I can't imagine that this is how they would dispose of them. So it just makes you think, did somebody go out and murder these dogs? Because it wasn't just one, end quote. According to Morgan, she saw this three or four times, and she did say that the complex kind of butted up right next to the ASPCA. She said there was fences, though, and a clear division of property, and she didn't feel like it would make sense that the ASPCA would dispose of animals in that way. I don't know what to think about this dead dog wrapped in blankets things. She, she kind of went into detail. She said usually they were completely wrapped in blankets, and you could just see like, like their paws or their tail hanging out. But one time she saw a dog with its head exposed and it was like a big German shepherd and it's wrapped in a blanket and there's like a couple different dumpsters around the complex and she would just randomly find these these dead dogs wrapped in blankets near the dumpsters. And I, I mean, I hope to God that ASPCA wasn't like putting people's dogs down and then just like tossing them on the ground next to dumpsters. That would be pretty horrendous, right? That would be horrendous. I I I don't think animal control, whatever. I don't think they would do something like that. It sounds to me like someone who's not in the field was was d disposing of these dogs, how they were doing it, obviously unethically. They're not licensed or trained to do it. You could also have a situation, and I'm, I'm going down a path here that could be completely wrong, but when you think about potential serial killers and, this, and escalation, they usually start with animals and will elevate to human beings. So could this have been a sign of someone who was living at the residence maybe or working at the residence and was fulfilling some type of sick fantasy by taking it out on small animals and then disposing of their bodies at these these dump sites? 
maybe I'm going down a path here just because, hey, listen, it sounds like this could be what she's saying. Like maybe this person yeah. who was involved with Jennifer's disappearance started with animals. That's how they were getting their gratification. And if that's the road she's going down, who am I to disagree with her? It's possible. There could be an explanation for it, as she said, but we don't know. So if we don't know, why wouldn't we consider it? Because that is that is very odd to just find dead animals around dumpsters. That's not a common thing. Yeah, like dogs too. Like, yeah, actually, yeah, <laughs> dogs, exactly. Even we, we've had situations where, and I've said this in previous episodes, but we've had dogs, cats, chickens sometimes where you find them and, and specifically the way they're killed is even more important. Like a you sacrifice. You want to look into that as well. Yeah, like a sacrifice, yeah. things like that. But sometimes, especially with serial kills, if you look it up, they will practice things that they would like or or have done on humans on animals first. So if there's weird things being done to these dogs where you could have something that's old or it was hit by a car or something, and that can, you can kind of see that immediately. But if it looks like these dogs have been tortured in any way, that's a red flag. And it's something that everyone should be aware of. And if management saw this, they should have been notifying law enforcement immediately. Yeah, management at uh, this complex seemed to really be on top of things. Yeah, yeah, honestly. I'm getting that gist. Pretty horrendous. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I, I wanted to know, like, if you're walking around, you're walking your dog at night, and you keep seeing dead dogs wrapped in blankets, where's your head going at first? Because it's not even like this dog died of natural causes and just happened to be by the dumpsters. Somebody wrapped them in a blanket, tried to conceal them in some way, and then, you know, left them there, which that's kind of creepy. I would be creeped out, too. I agree. Yeah. I would love to know how often this happened. Was it a one or two time experience where- She said at least three or four. Okay. That's, that's, and how long, she lived there for three years. That's a she lot. She lived there and for three years. Yeah. Even if I it happened a over a three year period, you're averaging a dog a year. That's the kind a pattern. of- It's yeah. a pattern. It's probably a, something we should look into. Yeah. So another odd thing is that Morgan claims she was never questioned by the Orlando Police Department or the FBI. No one asked her about Jennifer Kessie until 11 years later when private investigator Michael Toretto reached out to her. And I find that to be ridiculous because she lived there at the time Jennifer went missing. And not only that, she lived in the building right next to Jennifer. The police should have been questioning every single person who lived at that complex, especially the ones in the nearby buildings. And from what I what I'm gathering, it wasn't like it was a super packed complex to begin with. You know, it seemed like a, a lot of units were vacant and there weren't a ton of like full time residents. So that should not have been a hard thing to do. And especially when, you know, you've run out of leads initially and maybe you're a couple weeks in, like, what else are you doing? Why can't you question these people to see if they heard anything? How are you supposed to know if anybody heard Jennifer yell if you didn't even talk to the people who were in the building next to her? That's my concern. How do we know that Jennifer didn't yell that morning or scream out for help when you didn't even ask the people who lived in the building next to hers? I'm with you. So, so, so what you're telling me is that the FBI might have made a mistake as well? Well, I probably the FBI just followed whatever the Orlando Police Department did, no, right? No, no. You smug little ass. Yeah. Listen, so the Orlando uh, Police Department starts and then the Orlando Police Department, the FBI is just going to follow behind. No. So if the Orlando Police Department didn't do something, why is the FBI going to do it? The point I'm making is, uh, and I, I will say this, and I have friends who are in the FBI, but I will tell you right now, there's this 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 impression that FBI is that they're perfect. better. And they're and they're not and 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 I I say that with love working with these guys, but there is this idea that the FBI is this bigger, better version of local law enforcement. And sometimes it's the case. Sometimes I mean, it that's isn't. That's what we're that's what we're told. That's right? what you're that's, told. And yeah. I'm telling you from personal experience working with these guys, a lot of the situations these FBI agents are not even from the area that they're working. They could be from a different part of the country, and they're just stationed there. So they're coming in, asking the local guys like. Well, what street is this? They just, they're there because they were assigned to go over there and they're- Yeah, or they like, put where do you it. need me? You but know? but I, I, this isn't an FBI bash. I'm just saying, I was I was being sarcastic because it's an inside joke with local PD. Sometimes, a lot of times we say FBI is good for filling out paperwork. We'll just say that. But I do have a lot of FBI guys who are badasses who served over in Afghanistan and are the real deal. But back to what you were saying, talking about this whole inventory of residents at the property- absolutely should have been done and it reminds me of a little case in delphi indiana where <laughs> law enforcement initially did a, a interviews with everybody who was at the at the bridge that day and mm. come to find out it had a big factor in the case many years later that's why you do it yeah the person might be on the up and up when you initially talk to them but now you have a record of who they are and if something comes up later even if it's years later you can go back and reference that initial interview and see if they're giving the same statements as they did 10, 15 years ago. 
and you can start to compare and contrast. So absolutely agree with you. Should have, I knew it would have been tedious, would have taken a lot of time, but you got to go through names, date of births of everybody who lived at that property. And if you can, at least a brief interview with every single person so that down the road, if there's something to explore, you have those names and information to go back and look at. And the thing that bugs me is the police clearly had like a list of these people, right, in the files, because that's how Michael Toretta most likely found Morgan and the other people he talked to, because I'm sure he would have been talking to them before 11 years after Jennifer went missing if he had their information, because they're no longer living at Mosaic, right? They're in yeah, other places. So now he's got to track them down, but he can't do that if he doesn't know who they are. So now he's finally got the files and he has their names. And he's the first person that some of these people have ever talked to. The first yeah. person asking about Jennifer Kessie that some of these people have ever talked to. And that's that's concerning, I think. Like, that's that's bad. That's the scene of the crime, as the police have, you know, also accepted. I mean, you're not talking to people around in that vicinity. And, and I think it's crazy. Yeah, it, it is. It is concerning. And I'll say that I'm starting to feel, as I think I asked you this episode one, that maybe there are more people on this property than we we originally thought like it wasn't a building where just jennifer was there and then you know this happened it seems like especially thinking about morgan she had been there for three years yeah. so it does seem like there might have been a lot of vehicles in that parking lot a lot of people walking around so if someone went on the property that didn't work there but just was casing the place they could probably blend in pretty easy based on the environment that you've laid out tonight yeah, right. Because all these like random workers are there all the time. Nobody's right. going to question. A lot of cars, a lot yeah. of people coming and going. So that initial vision that I had that, you know, you got Jennifer's car in the parking lot and no one else around. No, it seems like this was pretty populated. And that also is concerning in another way, because if this girl was attacked and abducted outside her complex, how mm -hmm. the how the hell did nobody hear or see anything? It's right. just it's, it's tough to it's tough to think that would be the case. So there's there's another theory that we're going to talk about in a second okay. where maybe she wasn't. So Morgan also said that Mosaic was supposed to be a gated and secured complex. And initially, when she would first moved in, it had been that way. But it didn't take long for her to notice that the gates were usually left open. The gatehouse was unmanned. The gatehouse is where like a security guy will usually sit, like checking license plates of cars, like seeing who you're there to see, making sure like you have a legitimate reason to be there taking your name so there's a record of who is there. So basically, gatehouse is never manned. And uh, the the extent of the security there was a, a two or three maintenance guys who would like be riding around in a golf cart around the property sometimes. And at the time that Jennifer went missing in 2006, there were no security cameras anywhere on the complex. They would be installed two years later in 2008. And I, I personally found this to be interesting once again because Mosaic and Millennial was supposed to be this like high-end community, like super safe and secure, but they didn't have any security cameras, but just a mile down the street in a bad part of town in a less luxurious apartment complex, Huntington on the Green, where Jennifer's car was found, they did have surveillance cameras, at least as far as we know around the pool area. So I get the impression, and this is just a legend because I'm not trying to malign any businesses here, but... Allegedly, in my opinion, I get the impression that Mosaic and Millennial was was selling people a false bill of goods, <laughs> right? So it was kind of like one of those things where it looks super good on the outside. And even Drew Kessie in an interview, he was like, it was so nice. It seemed so nice. It seemed like it was all nice on the outside and they were doing a lot of renovation and a lot of like work on it to make it appear to be nice, like a, a nice looking shell. But underneath all of that, it seemed like they were cutting corners. They weren't keeping a ton of their promises as far as like safety and security and luxury. And I think they they were probably struggling when people started moving out, which is why they were trying to like convert them to condos. Because, you know, once you have somebody buying the condo, you don't have to worry about keeping the condo occupied and getting your rent every month. And so it seemed like they were kind of going into this transition period and they were selling people a false bill of goods to get these units occupied. And that's what, what happened. I mean, in Jennifer's case, right? Her and her parents thought this was going to be the best place. She'd be safe there. They thought she would be safe there. That was one of the main reasons they chose this this location and this complex. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. And I, the one excuse I'll give them, which I don't even know if this is true, but maybe it was a vision that they had hoped one day the complex would be. You know, mm -hmm. that this would eventually be this luxurious place with this high security and that was the plan down the road. And like you said, they're going through this transitional period where we're going to get cameras eventually. We're going to mm -hmm. have a gated guard, you know, a guard eventually, mm -hmm. but they hadn't yet. And so 
they should be more accurate in their descriptions, their current descriptions. I agree with you completely. That's best case scenario, by the way. So they were like manifesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have apartment complexes where they're going through it and they're like, hey, this is the goal. This is the vision. They'll have boards and pictures of what it could be. And this is the the different phases of it till we get there. But I think it's fair to say, and I don't own any big complexes, but I think it's fair to say that if you're going to have a complex like this, that one of the number one things you ins- you put in our security cameras. That's like the first thing uh, yeah. for many different reasons, but just at minimum to be able to go back and see the work that's being done and make sure it's being done appropriately at, at minimum. It gives you eyes on all these people that you're paying for these services. So that's, yeah, that's like number one that you would probably install. And it took them even two years after she gets she gets snatched to even put them in. So that makes Crazy. me think they just didn't have the funds. Which is very possible. They have these loans. They they raise these funds to do it with through venture capitalists, whatever it might be. And they're they're they got a bone structure at that point where they don't have the money to do the extra things. And they're hoping by selling the units they can then mm-hmm. use that money to get the yeah. things they need. So they're they're robbing Peter to pay Paul, and that's not a good business practice. Probably like bringing in just random workers, paying them like less than, you know, they would pay somebody who was bonded and secured and insured and just paying them under the table yep. and stuff. Like, yeah, you're cutting corners here. Like, yep. that's just my opinion. I'm not saying this will happen. Okay, no, allegedly. a lot of companies probably do that, by the way, but it doesn't come to this level of scrutiny until something like this happens. Until something like this happens. And, right. I, and then, yeah. then you're screwed. Apparently not. I mean, like, it seems like they just continued functioning just fine. Was there any lawsuit filed against Mosaic at Millennial? No. Doesn't seem like there was, no. Interesting. I mean, it might, yeah. somebody, legal representation might have told them there's no battle to fight there. You know, at the end, they weren't doing anything. You can't, there's nothing you can directly tie mm-hmm. to your daughter's case. So they might have said, save yourself the money. It's, go after the department. It's not worth going after them. I'm sure it was explored. Yeah. And I mean, they didn't sue the police department for money. They sued the police department for the files. That's all they wanted. That's right. And that, they knew that was going to be an expense, right? So it's one of those things where they probably, directed their funds and their their energy at one thing that they felt like they had the best chance of winning because it was never about money for them either you know no they don't they, they're not trying to be vindictive you know they're That's not right. trying to they, they just want to find out what happened to jennifer the files are going to get them there suing the the apartment complex although it's i not. will say i believe the apartment complex was negligent don't say that you're a gated secure 24 7 place when you're not because you're not especially if they were if they were like you said if they were featuring that as an item i yeah. don't know if, so that is that is something that yeah I would I would I'm on board with you there. So another former tenant Ashley she remembered Chino as well. She said he was fun and friendly and talkative and he would come over to her apartment quite a bit. After Jennifer went missing, Ashley wanted to ask Chino if he knew anything about it, and she said. Quote, you have keys to all of the apartments. What do you think happened? That's a really hard question to ask somebody that's sitting on the couch next to you. End quote. I don't think it is, but also on the down low, I think that there's something going on with Ashley and Chino, if you want to ask me. So in the end, Ashley said she and Chino never talked about Jennifer. And Ashley didn't even consider Chino as being suspicious until nine months after Jennifer's disappearance, at which point Chino just picked up and moved out in the middle of the night, never to return. Ashley felt this was weird because she thought they were friends. They talked all the time. He always visited her. And he had the chance to tell her that he was moving, but he hadn't, which made her feel like maybe he was running from something. This is why I feel like there's something more going on because if some weird rando maintenance guy is just coming over to my apartment every once in a while, we're chatting and then he moves out, I'm not going to be mad that he didn't tell me, you know, like right. it's not that serious. I'm not going to be like upset and all of a sudden be like, are you a killer? Because you didn't tell me you were moving out and I'm kind of pissed off about it. Like that's the impression I got. Mm. <laughs> so Ashley said, I sat on it for a little bit and it just ate away at me. So I did. I called the crime line back then and told them, and they took my statement, end quote. However, Ashley said no one from law enforcement ever followed up with her. And this is going to be a pattern. So not only do we have the police not questioning the people who live in the complex, but we have people calling in tips and saying, like, I think it could be this person who works at the apartment complex and, like, has keys to all the the apartments and nobody ever like calls her to take her statement or to get any information further. That's a problem. Yeah, it's. I wish not saying there would be a justifiable reason for it. Probably wouldn't be. And that's why we'll never hear from from anyone. But it'd be great to have someone who worked this case at this time on the show to sit down and maybe 
explain some of the the reasons for not doing certain things or doing other things. Like, I'm not saying there would be a viable excuse, but if we had direct connections with the investigators on this case, we'd say to them, hey, why wasn't this ever followed up on? Well, the reason it wasn't was because of this, this, and this. Now, we may look at it and side eye them and not agree with their practices, or we may say, oh, wow, we didn't know that. That's interesting. So it's always tough when you're only getting one side of the story because on the surface, there's no other way to look at this but bad. You have these in, you have these leads. Nobody calls and speaks with them. You've told me, what, two, three different women so far that have had these weird circumstances and they were never spoken to by police. From what you're telling me, there's absolutely no excuse for that. It's completely unacceptable. I mean, there is no excuse for that, right? Right. That's that's my that's my like take. How how else? I'm not trying to be a Monday morning quarterback here. It's just that's how it looks. If I have no reason not to believe these individuals that they were never spoken to, and so I I can't think of a reason where you wouldn't speak to them. So that's why I'm saying it would be great to have someone connected to it to try and give us a reason why that were the case. Why were multiple people? I could see if there were 30 people like this. Maybe uh -huh. one gets missed in the weeds. Yeah. But there's there's multiple people here and none of them have been spoken to. That's that's a pattern. It's not good. So like what I'm thinking is, okay, are you getting like a crap ton of tips in every day and then maybe you can't handle them all? That's understandable. Yeah. And like I get it. If somebody calls and they're like, oh, I saw her at a rest stop in California, you know, maybe you can't follow that. But if somebody who lives at the complex yep. calls and says, I Agreed. think that it's somebody who works here, he's suspicious – and you don't follow up with that, that's an issue. Like, yep. that's all I'm saying. You don't, I don't expect everyone to follow every tip. And there may be some, like, and there's been a lot of crazy tips in this case. Like, Joyce Cassie said somebody, like, approached her in, like, a strip mall and was like, oh, I, I think my husband did this. And she was just mad at her husband and trying to, like, trip her husband up, you know? So people do crazy things, confess to crimes they didn't commit, try to insert themselves, try to set other people up because of some vendetta but at the end of the day, this is just like a girl who lives in the apartment complex, a girl like Jennifer Kessie who says, hey, this guy's suspicious. He's kind of creepy. He's got keys to the apartments. He's always hanging around and he likes to go into girls' apartments and talk to them at 3.30 in the morning. Maybe you want to look into it. And to just not follow up, that's, yeah, that's an issue. I agree. So another former resident of Mosaic and Millennial, Colleen, she remembered something similar. When she had first moved in two years before Jennifer Kessie, security had been a bit more strict. And she said the guardhouse was manned at least 75% of the time, which still isn't great, by the way. If you're advertising a gated community, not a three quarters of the time gated community. So at first, Colleen liked it there. You know, she she felt it was safe. But then when the maintenance and construction workers began living in the empty units around the complex, things started to go downhill. Colleen said, quote, when I would come home from work, there would be a large group of men outside drinking. And whenever I would have to walk past them, you know, there would be a little bit of comments or just a lot of uncomfortable stares. It wasn't a great feeling. I didn't like it. End quote. Now, Colleen did complain to the leasing manager who was apologetic, but said that there was nothing he could do. And so these these construction workers were living at the apartment complex. Some of them, yeah. Some of them. Was there paper trails for them? Were they filling out leasing agreements or they're just saying, hey, while the apartment's vacant, you can just stay there? Yeah, the latter. That's crazy. I got nothing. And drinking, apparently. <laughs> I like got nothing. At night. Yeah. <laughs> I, got, I got absolutely nothing. And I, I think like, and then for the leasing manager to be like, I'm sorry that they're drinking and, and leering at you and making you feel uncomfortable, but there's nothing I can do. Yes, you can. They work for you. Tell them they can't drink on the job. Tell them yep. if they're going to live there, they can't drink and make tenants uncomfortable. Like, what do you mean there's nothing you can do? Yeah, that's ridiculous. And I, they probably weren't even paying them. Then they were probably in exchange for housing, letting them live there and for the yes. work they were doing. So that that's is yes, what it seemed like. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Stupid. Well, let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. I really do like going to the gym on a regular basis, but sometimes my schedule just doesn't afford me the opportunity to do that. I don't have the time. I have a million other things going on. And that is when Allo Moves comes in. Allo Moves is a streaming on-demand wellness platform that features yoga practices, fitness routines, meditation sessions, and so much more from one of my favorite brands, Allo Yoga. All their quality studio-style classes inspire me to take care of my whole 
whole being, body, mind, and spirit, so that I can go out into the world and do what I do best. And they really do have something for everyone, uh, from beginner to advanced. They've got yoga, bar, Pilates, cardio, even HIIT classes. They also have relaxed guided meditations, sound baths, and breath work, which are really nice for the evening to just sort of unwind and relax. There's more than just fitness to LO moves. You have to check out their gua sha, dry brushing, face yoga, nutrition classes, and so much more. And the best part is you need little to no equipment. I know the dry brushing classes have been super helpful because I do love dry brushing, but it's always confusing about where to start and which way to move. So Allo Moves really helps you out with that. And Allo Moves has tons of fresh content with over 100 new classes added every month, plus over 3,000 classes for every level beginner to advanced. I don't know if you realize, but for a fitness app, that is quite a bit of classes and quite a bit of new added classes every week. And I really love how Allo Moves fits into my schedule. All the classes are on demand when I'm short on time, which is always. <laughs> they have meditation and fitness classes for when I need to squeeze in a workout because I do like to move my body and do something that's, you know, going to help me break a sweat every single day. So I do really like all of that. I do like how it fits into my schedule. I love the class flexibility and I love how many classes they are because it's definitely like not ever getting routine. It doesn't ever feel stale. There's always something new I can try. So we do love Allo Moves here at Crime Weekly. And if you think you want to check it out for yourself, Derek's going to tell you how. That's right. It's not just us that's loving Allo Moves. It was voted the best wellness app of 2022 by InStyle Magazine and the best yoga app of 2023 by Women's Health. And for a limited time, Allo Moves is offering our listeners a free 30-day trial, plus, get this, 50% off an annual membership. But you can only get this by going to allomoves.com and use our code CRIMEWEEKLY in all caps. That's allomoves.com and all caps code CRIMEWEEKLY to get a free 30-day trial plus 50% off an annual membership. One more time, allomoves.com, code CRIMEWEEKLY in all caps. We're back from break, and now I want to talk about a woman named Tammy Valdez. So she did go by her real name, and she seems pretty pissed about what happened to her when she lived at uh, this complex. So that's probably why she has no problem using her real name. But she actually lived in the unit directly underneath Jennifer Kessie's, but she didn't live there until three years after Jennifer had vanished. She'd been living there for about six months. She lived there alone, and she said that's why it was easy for her to pick up on, you know, maybe things that weren't the way she'd left them when she went to work in the morning, things that were out of place in her apartment. Tammy claims that someone or more than one someone was entering her unit when she wasn't there, and this happened at least over two dozen times. Tammy said, quote, When I first lived there, there was just a lot of entry from management without my permission, and every time that I noticed it, and there was a few times that I wasn't even aware they had been there, but eventually I ended up finding out things from the office, I thought I had put a stop to people coming in by changing the locks, but then they came to me and told me that I had to put the lock back on that was there so they could have access to the apartment. So there was just a battle the entire time I lived there with management entering the home without notice or reason why, end quote. Tammy said there was a lot of signs that someone was in her apartment when she wasn't there. Food would be missing. Cans of soda would be missing from the refrigerator. There'd be garbage in her garbage can that she didn't put there. She would see footprints in certain places. Like one day she came home and saw a footprint in her closet and she said, listen, like I live alone. If I'm vacuuming in the morning and I'm coming home and there's footprints on my carpet that are not my footprints, then I know someone's been in here. And Tammy said she never wore shoes inside of her own home. First of all, she was a neat freak and she wouldn't do that. And she had a size six and a half shoe, yet over six times she saw footprints in her apartment that were shoe sizes 10 and up. So she went to management to find out why the workers had been in her apartment, but they told her no one had been in there as if they have a log or a paper trail or a way of being able to distinguish that anyways. It doesn't seem like they did. So a month after that, Tammy came home and found drips or drops of urine on her toilet seat, like a man had used her toilet seat. A few weeks after that, Tammy came home and found water in the kitchen sink as if it had just been used. One time she came home and found water in her shower as if her shower had just been used. And she told the complex management that she knew someone was in her apartment when she wasn't there. Like she was getting pissed off. She's like, you guys keep telling me no one's here. I'm telling you someone's in my apartment when I'm not there. 
but management kept telling her, no, we don't know what you're talking about. No one's been in your apartment. Tammy said one day she would come home and find her underwear drawer had been tossed, or she'd find cigarette butts in a plant that she kept on her patio. And she actually collected those cigarette butts in a plastic baggie so she could throw them out. And she just assumed like, oh, maybe it was the landscaper or something. But the next day she found a full unsmoked cigarette like in her windowsill. She said she felt someone was trying to leave her a message, like they wanted her to know that they'd been there and she couldn't do anything about it. So one day she came home and a bag of beef jerky that she had just purchased was opened and a handful was taken out. Stuff like that was happening and it was driving her crazy and there was nothing she could do about it. So on the evening of November 18th, 2009, Tammy said she got home from work, she got into her pajamas. She cuddled up under a blanket on the couch to watch TV. And as she was laying there, this weird feeling came over her. Tammy said, quote, That evening I'm laying on the couch watching television, starting to doze off. And I get the eerie feeling, and I see a shadow. And I can see a shadow, which I learned later was him, going from foot to foot. So you can imagine he was looking at me through the cracks of the blinds, watching me, fully dressed and covered, watching TV. I literally banged on the door thinking I was going to scare a raccoon off or something. And when I opened the door thinking a pest or maybe even a deer was out there, in the corner of my patio to the left, maybe six feet from me, is a man pleasuring himself with his zipper open, pants not down but open. And he was literally in the corner shook. He was stunned. He was so shocked that he froze for like half a second, end quote. So Tammy said that she basically screamed at the top of her lungs and she was like, get out of here. She said, she said she screamed, get out of here, motherfucker. I'll blow your head off next time you come around. And so um, he ran off. She called 911. Orlando police came to her apartment. They dusted for fingerprints, but then she never heard anything about it again. And according to Tammy, the man on her patio ran to a white van that was backed up to the iron fence that was like kind of nearby her apartment. She said this wasn't an actual parking spot. It was just like he had pulled up to the fence or backed up to the fence. She said he jumped into the van and the lights were already on because the vehicle was already running. And this scared her because she said there's only one reason someone would have like this white van with these blacked out windows backed up by my apartment and running. Basically, like he's not just there to watch me. He may be there to like take me and put me in his van. And remember, Jennifer's brother, Logan, when, you know, he came to find Jennifer the day that she was reported missing, he said he saw two men sitting in a white van and they were parked in the spot next to his sister's normal parking spot. And when he knocked on their window to ask if they'd seen Jennifer, they completely ignored him. Tammy said she thinks it's disgusting that although she saw this peeping Tom to, you know, face to face, like she saw his face, the police never called her. They never had her sit down with a sketch artist. They did not appear to be interested in finding this person, even though they were well aware that just three years prior, Jennifer Kessie had been abducted from that same location. Basically, like I said, Tammy lived in the same building. She just lived in the unit directly underneath. So even though the Orlando police knew what had happened to Jennifer, they knew she'd been taken. They didn't seem interested in like tracking this guy down, even though Tammy thinks that maybe he was kind of planning to do the same thing to her. I don't know if this is related or not. Three years later, it may just be another circumstance that has no correlation to Jennifer's case. But to not look into it, I, I don't understand why that would happen again. No, ju no justification for it. But I will say the one takeaway that I'm having is that this apartment complex was a mess. And it doesn't seem like things got any better after Jennifer's incident. So that's unfortunate. But this situation, it just seems like there's so many players in the game that are potential suspects. Uh, it would have taken a, a large team to go through all of this because it seems like they had multiple incidents and definitely multiple people on the premises before, during, and after the incident that are potential persons of interest. It would have been a big undertaking, but it, it should have been done. But there just seems like there's so much here that suggests that whoever did this had some connection to this apartment. As you've said in all all the episodes we've covered, whether they worked there, whether they lived there, whether they were visiting someone there on multiple occasions, someone had seen her in the past in some capacity and had decided to make her a target of some sort. Now, why they chose that day or why they chose that night, it may have been something like this where there was an escalation. We might have not have been aware of it, that they had been following her, stalking her, watching her moves until they saw an opportunity to act. 
One other thing I'll say to our listeners, which is more common now than it would have been in 2006. So by no way am I blaming Jennifer for this, but if you live in a complex that does have cameras, because we keep talking about the cameras, right? That is one thing. But those cameras on that building are not guaranteed to work when you need them. They're not guaranteed to be pointing in the angle that you'll need when something happens. So I strongly recommend, especially at the price point now, we've talked about a few different systems here, specifically Simply Safe. If you live in an apartment, get one for your in, the inside of your apartment. I don't care if it's discreet or obvious, put it somewhere where there's there's a camera on your door, camera on your patio windows, any point of entry that someone could come in or exit the your apartment, you should have it there. It's super inexpensive. You can have it on Wi-Fi. You can have sensors set up. So not only if you have a situation like this where someone's entering your apartment, maybe discreetly and not leaving you know, signs of them being in there behind, you would have evidence of it. And even more importantly, if someone enters your apartment, you can set it up so that motion sensors will be activated. And before you ever get home and you're surprised by someone, you'll be aware of it and you can notify police. We've seen numerous cases where this has been the situation and the tenant has been able to contact authorities and the suspects that were inside the apartment were apprehended. So a little bit of money, small investment, big payoff if something like this happens. Yeah, I mean, if if you feel like somebody's like stalking you or be, been in your apartment and the the complex you live in isn't taking you seriously, get a new complex. Is my oh yeah, that's number one. To you. Yeah, but in, in, in 2006, not as prevalent as far as security systems for the house. There, they were definitely a different world back then. It seems like it was yesterday, but it was. But now it's it's really something you got to invest in. It's a, I know we talk a lot about homes having them, but I feel like there's sometimes a false sense of security uh, when communities say, oh, we're, we have a security system, we have cameras. To me, whenever I investigated a case, it always seemed like every time I needed it, that was the camera that was out at the time and they, it's been broken for six months or the DVR isn't working. So just don't rely on it. You got to you gotta kind of do your own maintenance with that. Even if they say they, they have one, get a camera system. You'll thank me later. Trust me. Well, according to Michael Tretto, the Cassie's PI, all of this stuff, all of these women who had their own stories to tell, that was important because he said there was absolutely nothing in over 16,000 pages of police files that suggested there were any problems at Mosaic. But people who lived there said otherwise. They said they did have problems and they reported it to the police and they reported it to management. Yet none of that made it into the police files, which... <laughs> is also concerning, right? Also concerning. So Toretto claims that after he was investigating for a while, he discovered that at least 10 construction workers had been living in the empty unit directly across from Jennifer Cassie's condo. And he believes that it was one or more of these workers who abducted her. Drew Cassie, Jennifer's father, also believes that more than one person is responsible for taking Jennifer on that day so many years ago. And Michael Toretto believes that Jennifer left her apartment that morning she locked her door, turned her back to the apartment door across from her, and it was at that point that the individuals across the way struck. He said, quote, she's locking the door and never sees it coming. She was probably attacked immediately after exiting. She's dragged into the other apartment, and that's the end, end quote. And you would think that the Mosaic and Millennial Complex would, you know, have a record of who was occupying that apartment across the hall from Jennifer's. But according to Michael Toretta, they do not. He said there was no lease, not even a list of names. And many of the workers were people officially employed by Mosaic. But as I said, some of them were subcontractors and some of them were undocumented workers. Retired Orlando Police Sergeant Rich Ring said, quote, there were numerous interviews conducted at the Mosaic. A lot of the focus, of course, was circled around their transient workforce, the painters, the construction people. There was a lot of focus on that. There were comments, and we actually interviewed people who talked about workers at the complex and behaviors, and we investigated all those as much as we possibly could. I think the investigation revealed the fact that there was a pattern of misbehavior by the workers, not just by Jennifer's conversations with her father, but I actually spoke to a person who moved from the complex because she'd been taunted and teased and sexual innuendos by some of the workers at the complex, end quote. So the police talked to these people and heard these things, but didn't, you know, think to put it into the files or anything? I don't know. That's another thing. We talked about that before, too, even when they do it. If it's not in the report, it didn't happen. You know, if it's not on paper, we see that all the time where things are done at the time and we don't know about it later. So when new investigators look at it or when outside entities like a PI firm or even the FBI, 
if it's if you if you didn't write it down, how are they going to know? So yeah, it's exactly. very important. Even if it's a even if it's a nothing burger, like I like to say, it's important to document the lead went nowhere, so that someone else isn't repeating your work. And also, if they find something that contradicts whatever someone had said to you, even if they didn't come off as suspicious, you can go back at them with that, and you can bring the detective or police officer back in who initially interviewed them and see if that's accurate with, with what was written down. So very important. Very important stuff. You got to you gotta write everything down. You got to document it. So we're going to take our last break and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about Chino again for another minute because he was interviewed by police. And we're going to talk about that when we come back. So if you, any of you follow me on Instagram, then you know every single spring I do a really big garden. I like planting herbs and tomatoes and basil and all of the stuff that I cook with on a regular basis during the summer. But the issue is that I never have enough soil and, you know, we have to buy a bunch of soil and then it's never as nutrient rich as I would like it to be. And then I found Lomi. Lomi allows me to turn my food scraps into dirt with the push of a button. Lomi is actually a countertop electric composter that turns scraps into dirt in under four hours. There's no smell when it runs, and it's very, very quiet. And thanks to Lomi, I have way less garbage each week. I think that the the standard here is I'm going from like three bags of garbage to one because all of the food stuff that I normally just toss in the garbage is going into the Lomi, and then. And turning into this really beautiful nutrient rich soil that I can now use in my spring garden. And, you know, I have a lot of kids here and a lot of people eating. So basically, I have like an endless amount of this beautiful nutrient rich soil to use for my garden because we go through so much stuff and there's way less food waste. Since we got our Lomi, we're throwing out way less garbage. That means it's not going into landfills and producing methane. Instead, we're turning our waste into this beautiful nutrient-rich dirt that we can feed the plants. And I, I really like it. I feel great knowing that I'm composting and creating soil instead of waste. I, like I said, have basically a limitless supply of dirt for my garden. Like if I have food, I have dirt. And we go through so much food here with all these kids. They're eating constantly. So I really like that. Not only am I doing something for my Myself. I'm, I'm turning something that would normally be garbage into something that I normally spend money for, which is awesome, but I'm doing a good job for the environment. I'm helping the environment out. So it's really awesome. I, I love the Lomi, and I knew my husband was going to like it too because he's all about plants, but we've been loving it. We've been using it for about a week now. It is super quiet. It does sit right on your countertop, and you have to do nothing. You just put the stuff in there, push the button, and walk away from it. It's really great. It's very convenient and very great. Yeah, I love it as well. Being in an apartment, it's it's a pain to have to empty out the trash just because you threw some leftover scraps in there. And even though the bag's half full, it smells. So you got to get rid of it. So I'm really enjoying the Lomi. Use it every day now. And if you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just make cleanup after dinner that much easier, Lomi is the perfect product for you. Head to Lomi.com slash Crime Weekly and use our promo code Crime Weekly to get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to Lomi.com slash Crime Weekly and use our promo code Crime Weekly at checkout. Food waste is gross. Let Lomi save you a cold trip out to the garbage can. Okay, so we are back. Uh, let's talk about Chino because Morgan wasn't the only person who thought that he looked like the person of interest. You know, the person who was seen parking Jennifer Kessie's car just hours after it's believed she vanished without a trace. In 2009, three years after Jennifer went missing, Detective Joel Wright of the Orlando Police Department was led to a source who'd been working as a housekeeper at the complex when Jennifer had gone missing. Joel Wright said, quote, that housekeeper had never seen a picture of the POI that you see walking by the fence. So I showed her that picture and she said, that looks like Chino. So I went to my office and entered the word Chino into the tracking system. And sure enough, the first week of the investigation, a crime line tip had come in saying person known as Chino is involved in this, end quote. But of course, it wasn't followed up on back then, the first week of the investigation. 
So Chino wasn't spoken to until 2009. And at that time, Chino, along with the head of maintenance, Ben, who Chino was supposedly always seen with driving around the complex on a golf cart smoking weed, they were brought in for interviews. And also at that time, Chino was in prison for the sexual assault of a minor, which he had committed two years after Jennifer disappeared. Another factor that led to Detective Joel Wright developing him as a suspect. Wright said, quote, We did polygraphs and he passed with flying colors. My gut feeling, as far as suspects go, they're right at the top. At a minimum, my gut feeling is they know something about it. The chances of ever solving this case lies somewhere in the people who worked there or lived there. End quote. And uh, Detective Joel Wright was like, well, what do you think about Chino passing the polygraph test? And, and Detective Wright was like, I think that he passed the polygraph test. And that means absolutely nothing. <laughs> he was pretty, you know, I think it means that he passed the polygraph test. He's like, people pass polygraph tests. Sometimes they don't. They're innocent. Sometimes they pass and they're guilty. That's why we don't use them in court, because they're pretty much useless, as, as we've talked about before multiple times. I don't even know why they're going to give them to him then if you're going to – I think, God, obviously, if he failed it, it would have gave him some ammo to go back at Chino with. But obviously, once he passes it, it's a dead end. You can't, or can't maybe, you know, hoping to make him nervous and have yeah. him just confess instead of be caught, right. you know, kind of like right. Chris Watts. <laughs> mm, yeah. So during the interviews, both Chino and Ben admitted to having been in Jennifer's apartment doing some painting the week before she'd left for vacation with her boyfriend, Rob, to St. Croix. Chino and Ben said that everything was normal. Jen was there, she got ready for work, and then she left. She told them to let themselves out when they were done. But that's not really the story we got from Drew Kessie who remembered being on the phone with Jennifer when some workers were doing painting in her apartment and she was stressed because they were taking a long time and she wanted to leave because she had to get to work. Remember, Drew was like, don't worry about it. Like, just go to work, have them leave some of the paint and I'll do it. And then they were like, well, we can't leave the paint. And so he was like, whatever, I'll just get paint. Like, don't worry about it. Just tell them to leave and you leave. So Jennifer clearly didn't feel comfortable leaving them alone in her apartment. So I believe that Chino and Ben saying that Jennifer told them, oh, just, you know, lock up when you're done. I think they're lying because Jennifer definitely did not seem like the type who would leave two men that she didn't know in her apartment alone. And we also know that any time there were workers in her apartment, Jennifer made sure to be on the phone with her father, Drew, or her boyfriend, Rob. And her boyfriend, Rob, said, quote, I was on the phone with her because she had to let them in. And she said, I'm going to call you because I don't want to be in the house on my own with those guys, end quote. Now, Ben said that he and Jennifer had a normal conversation when he was there. She told them what work she wanted done, and that was it. And he said he wasn't aware of anyone who lived or worked at the complex that had a problem with Jen. Now, the podcast House of Broken Dreams actually tracked Chino down to talk to him. They were unable to find Ben for a comment. But Chino told the podcast that he couldn't remember much about that time. However, whatever he knew then, he had told the FBI. He said it wasn't him on that surveillance camera, he didn't wear his hair like that at the time, and he's taller than the suspected person of interest. He's 5'8", so technically he is taller than than the FBI say this person of interest was. And, you know, Chino really wanted everybody to know that he took a polygraph and passed, and he feels that he's being unfairly targeted. Peter Van Sant with CBS News also paid Chino a visit in 2021, and Chino said, quote, I met Jennifer Kessie. She was a beautiful person. She had no problem with me, end quote. He also said, quote, I even did a lie detector test. I mean, everybody knows for a fact that I had nothing to do with Jennifer Kessie, end quote. When asked where he was on the morning of January 24th, 2006, Chino said he didn't have to answer any more questions. So that's that's uh, all we're, we're done talking about Chino for now. But I think that he is probably very suspicious in this. And the fact that he went to prison two years after Jennifer went missing for the sexual abuse of a minor lets me know that he doesn't have like a huge moral fiber, you know, that like attacking Jennifer or, you know, sexually harassing her as many of these women say they felt sexually harassed by these workers when they were living there. It doesn't seem like that's something that's like out of his purview, I should say. I agree with you. And I would also say this is not a good sign of the – if you're taking the sampling as the type of clientele that were working at this facility, this is one person. What happened if they would have followed the breadcrumbs on other contractors that were working there or other maintenance people? How many more people would have this type of background – as they started to pull back the curtains. So you think about all the the plethora of suspects you would have 
if they were looked into as thoroughly as they should have been. Absolutely. And we don't even know where this Ben person is. And we don't even know like Ben's real name. We don't even know Chino's real name, right? People have tried to find Chino and like find his real name and stuff, but, and then they've like posted pictures. And that's why I didn't want to like talk about anybody specifically or post any mugshots or anything because they don't actually know if this, these people named Chino that they're posting these mugshots of are the Chino that might be involved with Jennifer Kessie. So like, we don't even really know who any of these people are or what their names are. But in this case, we also have two eyewitness sightings that could potentially be connected to the Jennifer Cassie case. Now, the first comes from a woman named Juliet who left her home on Snowflake Court in Orlando, Florida, pretty early on the morning of January 24th, 2006. That's the day that uh, that Jennifer went missing. Juliet said she was rushing around that morning because her husband had recently been diagnosed with prostate cancer and she needed to get him to a clinic across town by 8.30 a.m. for his first round of radiation. Juliet and her husband got in their car, and they began driving, leaving Snowflake Court and heading to Moxie Avenue. And Moxie Avenue happened to be, like, kind of come out right across the street from Mosaic at Millennial, the Mosaic at Millennial apartment complex. So as they waited at a stop sign for a break in traffic, Juliet claims she and her husband saw a four-door black Chevy Malibu leaving Mosaic, and she said, quote, We saw a struggle in the car as if someone was taking the steering wheel out of someone's hand, end quote. According to Juliet, this happened around 7.30 a.m. on the day that Jennifer Kessie vanished, and this would have been right around the time that Jennifer would have been getting in her car and leaving for work. Juliet said the car was clearly steering from side to side, but she couldn't see anybody inside. She didn't know how many people there were. She couldn't tell you if there was a passenger, a driver, nothing. Her husband also commented on the scene, saying it looked as if someone was fighting in the car, and he said they should call the police. Juliet said they didn't have time to call the police because they needed to be at the clinic. But while they were in the waiting room at the clinic, Juliet and her husband continued discussing what they'd seen and what it could have meant. It was when Jennifer Kessie's black Chevy Malibu was recovered and made the news that Juliet finally called the police and reported what she'd seen, and a few days later, Officers from the Orlando Police Department came to her house and took a statement, but they never followed up, and the FBI never contacted her. We know that Jennifer had told her mother that if she was ever the victim of a carjacking, she would try to crash the car, knowing that this would be her best chance. And Jennifer's father, Drew Kessie, had told her that if she was ever taken in a car, nothing good was going to happen. She needed to do anything and everything she could to draw attention to herself and that vehicle. So the question is, was that what Jennifer was doing this morning? Did these people put her in the car, as we had suspected, because there looked like there was some sort of struggle on the hood of her car, put her in the car. She was conscious, trying to take her someplace else, but she fought back. And she's got these, like, survival instincts because she's, you know, very safety conscious. And so she's trying to, like, wrestle the wheel out of her abductor's hands and try to draw attention to herself so maybe somebody you know, calls the police and and tells them what they saw. Obviously, I don't know if it was her. I do have a question that maybe I'm confusing. I I remember episode one, we talked about her having to be at work for around 9 a.m. So how far away was this was her work from her apartment complex? I think it was like uh, because it's the morning. I think that it took her usually like a half an hour or so to get there. And I don't know if she had to be at work at 9 a.m. or she just happened to get to work at 9 a.m. that Monday morning because she left Rob's house Okay, um, in Fort Lauderdale. So it's like a two-hour drive. So maybe she just ended up getting to work a little later. Okay. So maybe she had to be at work for eight. Yeah. Well, maybe 8.30, 9. um, You know, know, in Florida, I hear. And remember, we had the same talk about Casey Anthony because when, when we talked about George Anthony and the computer searches and him leaving for work before the computer searches were done, and he said he liked to leave for work early because he never knew like what the the traffic was going to be like and stuff like that. Maybe in Orlando, the traffic's really bad in the morning, so people leave work early. Maybe she gets coffee on the way. Who knows? Well, regardless, I feel pretty confident saying too much of a coincidence that our victim vehicle a vehicle matching a similar description is seen leaving that facility and displaying erratic behavior on the morning of her disappearance. Too much of a coincidence. So I, I, I although I can't say with 100% certainty, I feel pretty confident in saying that 
what these two individuals, two individuals, by the way, very key, two witnesses saying mm -hmm. the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, saw a vehicle, Chevy Malibu, very distinct vehicle that you would be able to identify, especially 2006, the, the taillights are very different than most vehicles. Uh, so seeing that vehicle matching the color to the description coming out of that area, displaying that type of behavior, I, I feel confident in saying this is probably a valid lead, which is obviously why law enforcement came and spoke with them and took a statement. Yeah, but then didn't follow up. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, because if they take a statement, it's a detailed statement. What if there's nothing more that they, they don't develop anything from it? What from an outside perspective are you expecting them to follow up on if they took a detailed statement initially? What would be the follow up? Well, I would assume that when the FBI came on, they would re-interview people, right? They they did re-interview some people, but they never yeah. came and talked to her. And if she saw Jennifer Kessie or who she thought was Jennifer Kessie wrestling for control of her car back, you'd think just to cover their bases, they'd want to sort of like speak to her. Yeah, I can see it. I, I, I've been I've been pretty hard on them this episode, law enforcement, as far as all the stuff they've done wrong. I, I'll say on this one, if it's a if it's a clear statement, I'm assuming the initial Orlando officers said, "Hey, did you happen to see anybody in the vehicle?" And mm -hmm. it was probably no. So if they're trying, if the investigation, as you said earlier, if they got thousands of leads, maybe they figured, "Hey, they told you before they didn't know who it was." There's really nothing more they can add. So I, I'm with you. A follow up would be great. But I'll give them a little bit of a pass on this one from the, the law enforcement side, because maybe the, the in, initial investigation or the initial interview was very thorough. Mm -hmm. um, and they just, FBI didn't feel there was a need to go back and, because the, the first statement's always going to be the best, by the way. Mm -hmm. If you give people more time now that they've yeah. seen the news, they've seen other things, they start to remember things that they didn't actually see. So yeah. usually your first statement's going to be the best. So I'm, I'll, I'll go easy on them on this one. There's too much others things that I didn't like earlier. So, uh, but this is, this is very compelling information to, to know it. It really does give us a little bit more of a time frame and, a, and an understanding of what might've taken place. Yeah. Because she said she didn't even see like what we were they were turning. Cause they like Juliet and her husband had turned to, to leave and That's go to right. the clinic before they even the other car, you know, assuming Jennifer Cassie and her abductor even like pulled fully out of mosaic. That's right. So they didn't even see which way they turned. might have been yeah. 12 seconds. You know, you're talking. So it's like how much they they want to be helpful. They call police, but how much can they give you? So that statement might have been as detailed as it could be. And unfortunately, there was nothing more that they were hoping to get out of. They might have said, hey, if you have more information, by all means, give it to us. But even then, you have to take into consideration that now they're seeing the media. Now they're seeing other accounts and they may start to try to fill in blanks because they want to help. Yeah. And I mean, not only that, I know it seems like a coincidence, but we don't know 100 percent sure that it was Jennifer and, yeah, and her abductor that's at fair. that moment. That's fair. So you could say like, oh, at least this eyewitness gives us an idea of what happened. Like they didn't keep Jennifer at the apartment complex. They took her right away. But we don't even know for sure that it was Jennifer. So we can't even say that 100 percent. So it really Not 100%, leads no. nowhere. Yeah. But I do. But if, you, if we're gambling right now, we would both put a large sum of money on the fact that it was her vehicle. Yeah, I would. I would definitely agree. Um, if that's what was seen, if that was absolutely what was seen on that day, then yes. But we have to keep in mind eyewitness testimony is so unreliable. It could have been a different day, could have been, you know, a different time. So we we do have to keep that in mind, too. No, it's a great point. And, and I will say if it is the vehicle in question on that day, we also have to caution you guys not to automatically assume that it's exactly what it appears to be, which would be a situation where Jennifer is coming out of her complex. She's attacked and then she's fighting for her life in the vehicle as they're driving away. There's also a situation where... At that point, she's already been rendered unable to defend herself any longer, and this is the suspect or suspects fleeing the scene erratically because they're trying to get out of there as quick as possible. That could also be mm. she may not be in the vehicle at that point uh, in control in any way, shape, or form. So, and, and I also think because I'm playing both scenarios out, I think a lot of people, and we talk about thinking outside the box, right? So I think a lot of people would look at this and say, okay, you have damage on the hood of the vehicle. So this is what happened. She comes out, she's attacked from behind, there's a struggle on the on the hood of the car, and then she's brought inside the vehicle, and then as they're leaving, they're fighting over over the the drive the steering wheel as they're fleeing. That's possible. Mm -hmm. But here's another scenario. She comes out to the car, they want to get her uh, they want to get her inside the vehicle as fast as possible to avoid anybody seeing anything or hearing anything. Mm -hmm. So they let her open her door. They let her start to get inside. And as she's getting inside, they push her in all the way. They hop in the vehicle as well. They shut the door. Now they're driving out. 
They're fighting over the car. She's, she's trying to fight with them instead of maybe jumping out of the car. This is where the witnesses see them. Now, once the offender or offenders, because there could be multiple people in there controlling her, they go to a close location, they pull her out of the vehicle, and now they're fighting some more because as you said, Jennifer's going to fight. And that's at the point when the damage on the hood of the car occurs. When they get her out, they're trying to restrain her. They're fighting on the hood of the car. And unfortunately, whatever happens, happens after that point. They're there for an, ex an extended period of time. And then the car is dropped off at the other complex. So they could have been at a location that was a wooded area right in between the two complexes for an extended period of time. Then they drive down the rest of the way, drop the car off and walk back to the apartment complex where their other vehicle is or where they had been working that day. Just something to think about. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it could, I, I think like what you said that it, she might not even be in that car at all. Correct is Correct. very telling yeah she could be in a van she could be in another car but now they're taking their car out and they don't want to be seen in it so they're you know they're trying to get their seat whatever they're trying to do at that point oh we don't want to look this suspicious so they're you know they're, they're driving out of the parking lot fast and the good witnesses saw something that was out of the ordinary it does sound like it was a struggle based on them what they were saying but mm -hmm. that's open to interpretation it depends right. on their perception exactly. um, but we have another witness who believes that she saw something that might be connected to jennifer cassie and this woman wanted to remain anonymous as well they call her elizabeth um i think elizabeth sounds a lot like mrs doubtfire in my personal opinion but elizabeth said that in november of 2006 she'd been at her friend's house for the weekend uh the friend's parents were in philadelphia for a wedding and this friend of hers lived on lake fisher in orange county and in 2006 there was only one house on this lake the house that elizabeth and her friend uh, happened to be in and then there was one being built next door otherwise no other houses the area was pretty secluded elizabeth said the house that she was at had a back garden that overlooked the lake and she remembered that on the saturday morning of that weekend it was a nice and sunny day so around like 8 30 she went outside and she decided to sit by the pool at which point she was looking out over the lake when she saw something on the other side the other side of the lake at that time was just fields and a sloping hill so when a dark colored pickup truck began driving through the fields, Elizabeth took notice and watched as it pulled up to the edge of the lake and parked parallel to the lake. She said a man got out of the truck, looked over his shoulder, and then pulled a large rolled carpet from the bed of the truck. Elizabeth said the carpet was pretty big and it looked like there was something inside. He threw the carpet over his shoulder, walked to the lake, and threw the carpet in before making his getaway. Initially, Elizabeth had said that she thought this was very odd. Why would someone throw a carpet into the lake? For years, she didn't say anything about it, but one day she heard about Jennifer's case and wondered if what she had seen could have been connected. So she called the friend she'd been staying with to verify that it had been November of 2006 that they spent the weekend at the house on Lake Fisher. This was a lake located just 12 miles from Jennifer's condo and just one mile from her place of work. The friend confirmed that Elizabeth had the month and year correct and hooked Elizabeth up with her boyfriend who happened to be a Florida State Trooper and he got Elizabeth in touch with law enforcement officials responsible for Jennifer's case. But before the police could do anything, the Cassie family decided to make a move and they brought in two cadaver dogs to Lake Fisher in November of 2019. And Drew Cassie claims that two dogs hit on something, that they smelled something, that they alerted to something. But when the Orange County Sheriff's Department came in with their own dogs and divers, they claimed to have found nothing. Drew Cassie said that he was upset the police had only searched a small portion of the lake. He said it had been several years and the carpet could have moved or drifted, so they should have searched more of the lake. And the Cassie family and their PI ended up bringing in their own divers. They did radar. They brought in more dogs. But this time, the dogs didn't hit on anything, and the divers didn't find anything in the lake. Basically, Drew Cassie said they did everything but drain that lake. However, Elizabeth is 100% sure that that carpet is in the lake. She said she saw a man throw a carpet in the lake, and she believed it's still there, as does P.I. Mike Toretto, who claims that if they can get their hands on that carpet, even if there's no dead body inside, they can test it for blood or DNA or compare it to carpeting that had been removed from the Mosaic and Millennial Complex in 2006 when they were doing renovations and removing a lot of carpet, including carpet from that unit directly across from where Jennifer Kessie lived, the unit that allegedly housed 10 construction workers.
Yeah, this lake, when we were looking into it for for breaking homicide, this was one of the things that I had alluded to uh, in episode one, where we, we were our wheels were turning where what could we do with this? You know, how could we how could we make this an element of the show where we took it a step further by definitively ruling this lake out or or finding something in there that we could potentially use? There's also a world where you find the carpet and because of the condition, it's you know, how long it's been in there, any type of evidence that would be contained within it, maybe gone. You wouldn't know until you tested it because it obviously a lot can happen. And what are we talking here? 13 17, years? 17 years, I 17 think. years. Mm-hmm. Thanks for the math there. That's a long time. So it was one of those, it was a financial thing, right? It was going to be very expensive. You would have to, have, this lake's huge, by the way. It's not like this little pond. So it would have been a lot of money and it definitely wasn't in the budget because it, so that was one thing where I had this dream of doing it but it, it wasn't possible. You would need a dive team like, mm-hmm. I won't say the name of the company that, you know, we just covered on Crime Weekly News, but a company like that to go they out who there. who shall not be named. You would have to have Elizabeth go back out there with them because it could it could drift, but how far would it really drift? I, I don't know. That's In why 17 need, years? I mean, I would think if the body weight, if you're, if it, you're talking a couple hundred, a hundred pounds, especially a carpet, once it gets wet, it would, you know, you'd have to, put off a radius, but I don't know what, did they have FBI divers in there? I don't know what type of divers went in there. You're saying it was privately done by the Kessie family, right? So the Orange County Sheriff's Department brought in divers and then the Kessie family also brought in divers. That's a lot of divers. That's a lot of divers. That's a lot of divers. Even if some of them aren't as good as the others, you would think by accident they would find it if it was there you could all I used I, to think like it was so easy to find stuff when you dive, but oh no, it's, it's really not. There. Like You, and, you basically then, gotta, you gotta walk into it. Yeah, the carpet could like look like, especially if it's like neutral colored carpet, like it could really just blend in with like the lake floor and it could be buried, like you said, like sediment and silt and all those other S words, sand could just, I mean, this is Florida, so it could just be like completely covered up at this point. I don't know why I said this is Florida. I just think there's a lot of sand in Florida. (laughs) Yeah, I mean... (laughs) There is, but I mean, this everyone should look it up. <laughs> everyone should look it up. You can you can see what we're showing you. Like, it, it's a big area, and uh, it's not the biggest lake in the world. But it would be very expensive to to drain. I don't even know if it would be possible. I don't even know if they would do it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I don't know if it would be possible. Not for this lead because yeah, it could be connected. It may be. It may be just someone who is dumping trash there. For all we know, we don't even for know real. Yeah. if it was connected. So the resources and money to do it, you would like to think that the budget is unlimited for to some for something like this, but that's realistically not the case. So mm-hmm. do I think it was connected? I'm not even going to say whether I do or not, because there's not enough information to make that assessment. I believe Elizabeth. I believe she saw what she said she saw. Mm-hmm. I think the timing is interesting. November. That's why I don't think there was a body in there. November. How many yeah. months after January is that? 11. Yeah, it's it's yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a it's a long time and you're on with the math tonight by the way. Yeah, everything else late. has died cuz I've been up for, you know, 22 hours at this point, so every other part of my brain is done, but the logical side is on right now. The math came in. <laughs> Jesus. But I, it was something we perked my ears up when I when I heard it when we were initially talking about it, but it it, it was the exact conversation you you and I are having right now. That's the conversation that was going on between my team and the producers, it's like, there's a reason they didn't do anything else. There's not much mm-hmm. you can do. We could have went down there and sent other divers in because you never know. They might find something. But yeah, I think it's an interesting piece of information, but there is a very strong possibility that it's not connected in any way, shape, or form. And it may not even be a criminal act other than disposing of materials in a body of water where it should have been disposed in a dumpster. But I don't know why contractors will usually drive around, find a dumpster nearby at an apartment complex or another construction site, and they'll dispose of any trash they have so they can avoid the dumping fees because it goes by weight. They don't normally drive out to a wooded area, to a lake, to throw a carpet into it. It's very suspicious. I will say that. And I do believe Elizabeth. And she said, you know, the guy, she couldn't really see him clearly, but he looked like he was wearing work clothes. And even the truck looked like a work truck. It didn't look like, you know, a a pickup truck that somebody would drive for personal reasons. Like it was a big one and looked like a truck you would use for work. So, yeah, Yeah. it's suspicious. But even if you found a carpet, because I don't think there would be, once again, I don't think there would be a body in there 
11 months after she goes missing, right? Or even, you know, 10 months because it's the end of January. I don't think there's going to be a body in there. So even if you found that carpet, it doesn't even lead you to Jennifer and definitely doesn't lead you to the person who, who took her or hurt her. That's right. And or you could, and you could end up spending tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars and not find a single thing. Oof. Could you imagine they drain the lake, no carpet? Oh, that's a someone's getting fired. <laughs> someone's getting, definitely getting fired. Just completely like destroy like a whole ecological like. Yeah, that's the, and those are all <laughs> the other things that we don't talk about that come into like the the process of of draining a lake uh, or any any type of when we think about oh why can't they just b- break up the ground and start using you know these are all think conversations that happen behind closed doors where it's like okay what's the financial significance what are the environmental significance you know what how, how many much ecosystems are we, are we destroying yeah, yeah with DEMs in the meeting as well going no you're not doing that you know so there's yeah there's a lot of different people that are involved in those decisions and I think if it was stronger. For example, if they had said it was a black Malibu that was in the wooded area and it was the, the day after her disappearance, I feel like they'd be draining that lake. I feel like they, they would be more significant and they might say, okay, a Chevy Malibu black was over there and a guy gets out with a white outfit on and he drops a carpet in there. I feel like they're rolling the dice and, 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 uh, and draining the lake. But because of the time frame, because of the a vehicle that probably wasn't on the radar, I feel like those elements were considered. Yeah, and I I don't think at this point that they're going to continue going back to that lake either. No, no. Mm -mm. They've sent two different teams in there at this point. Yeah. And I mean, as of now, it's 2023, right? The Kessie family is still fighting. In January, just this past month, they were finally given the green light to have the case looked at by state officials. And although Drew Kessie believes that it will be a miracle if Jennifer is found alive, he's hopeful now that the Florida Department of Law Enforcement is working with his team of private investigators. Drew said, quote, I think right now we are in the best position in 17 years because the FDLE wants the case. They know what they are doing. It's a cold case division specifically looking at the case. They are feeding off the work my guys have done for the past few years. My guys can't go in and make arrests, end quote. And according to Drew Kessie, the FDLE has now received everything and they're eager to move forward. But the sad part is they have found that over the last 10 to 12 years, no one has been looking into Jennifer's disappearance. Drew said, quote, we assumed things were happening, but when we received the files, there was nothing written in the last 12 years, end quote. That's crazy to me. The good news is that Drew and his family are still receiving leads. Uh, he said they they keep receiving leads every week for the past 17 years, so there's paths to follow. But Drew sadly said, quote, we doubt very much that Jennifer is still alive. It would be a miracle if she is. We just aren't willing to say, oh, well, and leave it, end quote. In 2008, two years after anyone saw Jennifer Kessie, the Florida House passed Senate Bill 502, the Jennifer Kessie and Tiffany Sessions Missing Persons Act. This law requires law enforcement to begin looking for missing adults 25 years and younger within two hours of a missing persons report. Tiffany Sessions went missing on February 9, 1989, while she was attending the University of Florida in Gainesville. Her parents also believed there was a slow and lackluster police response. Even though the FBI have said that the search for Tiffany was the largest in the history of Florida, but she, like Jennifer Kessie, has never been seen again. And I love this law because we talked about this, I think it was last episode, where it's like, if if somebody says somebody's missing, do something about it. You know, don't wait 48 hours. And this makes them have to take action within two hours. So yay. Yeah, that's great. And it's it's good to see that they're creating new policies and procedures that law enforcement, ha- there's a standard to be followed, right? Because a lot of it, times it's individualized by each department and they all have different standards that they follow. And that's when you have situations where one department may conduct an investigation one way when it comes to a missing person and one may conduct it another way. Now you have a state bill, an act that's been passed that forces all departments to adopt a policy so that there's some continuity regardless of what jurisdiction you're in. Uh, as far as this case is concerned, it's obviously extremely troubling. I think Drew said it best, and as a as the father, I'm going to follow his lead on it. Where it would be a miracle if if Jennifer were still alive, but there is a chance. There is a chance, and I think regardless of what he may feel, what his family may feel, he's got the right idea. Where he's not going to stop until he knows for sure. He'll spend the, the, his last breath doing this, and I think 
Most parents would. So where do we stand on this one as far as what do we think happened? What what are we potentially looking at here? I wrote down a couple things. And just to qualify, this is our opinions. And Stephanie, I haven't shared this with you, so yours may be different. But for me, it's definitely, and this isn't a shocker to you, but it's someone very familiar with the property. Why do I think that? Jennifer's schedule. This is something where the person would have to know when she's coming out of the house, when she's going in. And more importantly, they would know, is she with anyone? Is anybody else staying there? Is there a guy or a girl that they have, a roommate, someone they have to be aware of that would be maybe walking out with her in the morning? So I feel like whoever this person was knew Jennifer to the extent of, at minimum, I see this girl coming out of this unit every day around this time, and she's always alone. And that's something that has to be done over a period of time. So you could potentially say, oh, well, maybe it's just a stalker, like I said earlier in the series. And that is possible, but I think through reasonable deduction and some of the other things that I'm going to talk about, I think it's more likely that, again, it's someone who's familiar with this exact property. And that is mainly because whoever this person was, they knew there was no security system there, right? This, As you said, this place was being marketed advertised as a secure facility. So from the outside, if you're doing research, you're probably going to think, Hey, there's cameras here. There's, there's some type of system in place, maybe not the best building to pick as Mm -hmm. far as carrying out something like this. However, if you're on the inside, you know, there's no security cameras, you know, the security, the physical security itself sucks. You know that people are allowed to go in and out of the building at all times of the day. And you know that there's a key or keys that can access the majority of the apartment. So you know that the security is shit and that's something that you can hide yourself within, but you wouldn't know that as just a person off the street who's sitting in the parking lot, watching someone from a distance, this would be inside information. Uh, and then the, the this kind of goes into the video. I wanted to talk about that as well, but this goes hand in hand with the idea that this person was someone from the apartment and that's the dog scent, right? You have the dog scent being tracked back from the other complex all the way to Jennifer's complex. I don't think that's a coincidence. Mm-mm. I think that that was tracked because her scent was on the suspect, the suspect that you see on that video, the suspect that appears to be walking back towards in the direction of Jennifer's complex. Why would they be doing that? Well, they worked there or their vehicle was there. They have some connection to it. Mm -hmm. There's really no other reason to go back there other than they have something there that they have to go back to. Which brings us to the video. As as you said numerous times, it's close to the mosaic. They parked at this other complex because they needed to be able to get back to the original location and, and have it be within walking distance. There's really no other reason you would park there because you're only creating a situation where you could be caught. You, you don't want to be anywhere near the scene of the crime. I don't necessarily believe that the incident occurred at the property, although I have nothing here to say that it didn't. I just, my gut tells me that because of some of the evidence we have, Jennifer was still alive and coherent when she left that property. And and the reason for that is because of the struggle, the sign of struggle on the hood of the vehicle. Mm-hmm. If she had been abducted and taken back inside, Unfortunately, I think by the time she was removed from that apartment, she would be unconscious or dead and -hmm. there would be no struggle on the car unless the struggle happened when she was attacked and then she was rendered and brought back inside. Right. Is it possible? Yes. I just think if you're planning this out and this is some type of premeditated act, there's going to, you don't know what, who's going to walk out or who's going to hear it. So you attack this woman outside. She yells, she screams, somebody sees something. You're going to walk back into the building where you can be found by law enforcement or someone else for that matter, who may have seen or heard something. I think it's more likely that the, the person or persons would grab her and want to get her out of there as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think the witness testimony that you laid out tonight affirms that, that she, there was something going on where either they were fighting in the car or they were leaving the the apartment complex at a fast pace because they didn't want to be seen or, or heard from. Mm-hmm. That's that's really all I think we can surmise from all of this. Definitely was an abduction. Who was involved? Nobody knows for certain, but I do think a lot of the evidence points in the direction of someone who was familiar with the property. I won't go as far as saying it's a, a construction worker, although based on the video and the painter's outfit, it kind of looks like, if I had to guess, I would say that. Mm. But I think it's equally possible that it's someone who's part of management, someone who's part of their lackluster security, or someone who actually <laughs> lived at the building as the main resident, or maybe just someone who had been staying with another resident for an extended period of time. I think all those avenues are still at play. 
Absolutely. I got, I'm, I'm on the same page. I think it's definitely somebody who lived there or worked there or both. Right. There's no other way. Like you said, there's no other way that they would know she lived alone, that she wouldn't be walking out with somebody, that somebody wouldn't be wondering, you know, where she was right away. Things like that. There's no way that they would have known that. There's no way they would have known her schedule if they hadn't been there and watching her. I would go as far as to say if you you had to ask me, like, who did this? I would say it was one of the maintenance workers. Yeah. I don't know who. I wouldn't necessarily say Chino, Ben. I don't even know these people, you know. But if there's like 10 of them living in the apartment across from her, they could be watching her. They could be even using their key to go into her apartment when she's not there. You know, they could be doing things like that similar to what Tammy was dealing with. And they could be like stalking her, going through her underwear drawer, stuff like that. And she just didn't notice. She was only there for two months. So that could have been happening. But uh, either way, you know, I, I don't... um I don't think it's going to be solved at this point because somebody knows something. I think more than one person knows something, but they've kept quiet for this long and there's absolutely no motive for them to to be honest and upfront about what happened now after all these years. Yeah, it's you could have a dying declaration, but yeah. chances of that are slim to none. I, yeah. I agree with you. And I think we're in a situation where there's no way to avoid the fact that this was broad daylight. In, in, in a pretty populated area, right? I mean, yeah. we're learning now that there was a lot of residents there, a lot of contractors. Not a lot, but you know, a like, good amount. Enough yeah. where, enough where, if I were the offender, probably not the time or place that I'm going to pick to attack someone because there's too much risk that someone's going to see me, see my vehicle, see something that's going to link back to me. There's a lot better places to take advantage of a situation where, obviously, the cover of night. A, a more private area, you know, somewhere it's a little bit more secluded, a lot better potential spots to pick a, 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 a victim. Kind of feels like, like they were confident that nobody was going to see them, right? Exactly. To choose this time and location, you know something. You know that you're not going to be seen or heard. How else would you know that unless you're very familiar with that specific mm -hmm. property? And I don't think we're like figuring out something really unique here. It sounds like in the information that we had, Law enforcement believes that as well. They don't think this was a random act of violence. They think it's someone associated with the property. And 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 I think uh, we tend to agree, which is why I just wish there was more done at the time when it happened, because that was that was when it was the best opportunity yeah, to really exactly. make people uncomfortable, including yeah. including subcontractors, contractors, residents. Get everybody's name. Get yeah, everybody's it's got to be uncomfortable. Yeah. It's got to be uncomfortable. It's got to be invasive. If you need to get search warrants, then you need to get search warrants. But... You got to make an attempt to identify every single person who had been at that property the week leading up to it, the week after it. And by the way, anybody who decided within a couple of weeks to maybe not work there any longer or stop showing up or moved out relatively soon after. These are all things you got to be mean, documented. They were like coming and going, you know, yeah. they just showed up when they wanted. So there wasn't any rhyme or reason or order to it anyways. Yeah. No, it, it seems like it would be a cluster, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Mm -hmm, you know, there should have been at least at minimum from what we've seen there should have been more documentation showing that law enforcement was making people's lives very uncomfortable because they were being a pain in the ass frankly trying to identify every single person and speak with them one-on-one -on -one. yeah it doesn't look like that happened it doesn't you're right maybe it did though i don't know maybe they, it did and they just they didn't talk about it or write about it or that's the problem it. though right yeah. that's the problem well because i don't think it happened that's why i think they didn't talk about it and write about it because if they spent their time like harassing people and trying to get their names and stuff you best believe they're going to be shouting themselves out on paper so that everybody knows how hard they worked and what they did that leads me to believe that it didn't happen but this is my opinion no i think i think you're right and i think it's sometimes easy for people to to say oh well they didn't document it because it ended up as a, a it was a dead end. Well, I disagree with that. And I think most investigators would because it's as important to identify persons of interest or even suspects as it is to exclude certain people. They're both equally yeah. important because if you have a pool of a hundred people, what's going to be easier to solve a pool of a hundred people or a pool of 10 people, right? Well, the only way to do that is to go to all the other 90 people and find alibis or, or, or be able to definitively rule them out with exculpatory evidence. You can't do that unless you document it because other investigators are going to look at it 
and they're not going to know that that's been done. And now you got people chasing yeah. their tails. So that's you got to document you know, everything. You have investigators coming after you, even if they're cold case investigators, and you want to set a good foundation for them. You don't want to just right. be like, well, I looked and didn't find anything, so that guy can figure it out for himself too. Like yeah. that's kind of a dick thing to do, right? No, you got to document. Sometimes it's just laziness, right? I've had it be as a sergeant. I've had it happen where it's it's like. Hey, did anybody follow up with this case over there? Yeah, I went there last week. Well, I'm looking at IMC right now, and there's nothing in there that says that you did it. It says it's closed, but there's no narrative. So even if it's like two sentences where it's, you know, this date, this time, Detective Lavasser went by this location, spoke with Stephanie Harlow, stated that they, she didn't see anything at this time and date, case closed. You know, whatever, the whatever the, just something there is better than nothing. Because mm -hmm. now you can go back and talk to that investigator if you want to follow up with them. If mm -hmm. you don't write anything down, how do I know? So it's not an isolated incident to Orlando PD. It happens a lot, unfortunately, but this is a frustrating case because it, it, it's a solvable case or it was a solvable case. And I think at this point, Drew and his family is just hoping that there's somebody out there with a conscience who may be aware of what happened to her, but not directly involved. And for some reason, whether it's there for their own incentive, because they get pinched for something else, or they just want to come clean, that they come forward and it gives them some actual evidence or information where they can go and find jennifer and and if she's not alive anymore at least bring her home they just want to find out what happened to her that's it i think i think they know that she's she's not coming home but they want to know what happened to her they've been working so hard they can't just stop and then it's all for nothing so our hearts go to the cassie family jennifer's friends um, everybody who cares about her, everybody who's out there fighting for her and has been fighting for her for 17 years. And we're right there with you. And hopefully there are new updates in this new direction that the um, FDLE is taking with the Cassie family it leads to, you know, something good, maybe a break in the case. We are always hoping and no matter how unlikely it is that, that anything could happen. Thank you guys so much for being here. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at crime weekly pod that's right and if you're listening on audio take 10 seconds a lot of people have been doing it lately five star review a little comment it goes a long way helps boost us up on apple Podcasts and spotify yes thank you guys so much we will see you next time for a brand new case and i am going to bed <laughs> all right guys stay safe good night bye <laughs>